While we may think of ourselves as advanced after catching a glimpse of the eight planets of our solar system and their 200 moons, we really have little idea of what's out there. So much so that there's speculation that there might be one more planet in our solar system. Scientists call it Planet X or Planet 9. This undiscovered world could be hidden way out past Neptune. Asteroids and dwarf planets in this area have weirdly unexplained altered orbits, and Planet X may be the reason. Tales of this mysterious planet began over a hundred years ago with a man called Percival Lowell. Lowell had a great love of space, and aside from having an impressive mustache, he was also super rich. Ooh, that lucky guy! He used his riches to build an observatory in Arizona. He then dedicated it to study the odd motions of Uranus and Neptune. Their gravitational pulls are slower than those of all the other planets in our solar system, almost as if there is a giant hidden object pulling them off course. In 1906, Lowell theorized that there could be another planet out beyond Neptune. It probably caused those strange cosmic happenings. The man called this potential space body Planet X. In 1930, Pluto was discovered by Clyde Tombaugh at Lowell's very own observatory. It finally looked like people had an explanation for the weird orbital patterns. Lowell's team was on cloud 9 after the discovery, but their celebrations were short-lived. Soon, they found out that Pluto is way too small to be having that much of an effect on the surrounding planets. And it was also too far away from them. So it was back to the drawing board. Planet X, if it exists, is 10 times the size of Earth and 4 times its radius. It would take at least 10,000 years for the planet to orbit the Sun. And it would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. That's 600 astronomical units from the center of the solar system. FYI, an astronomical unit equals the distance between the Earth and the Sun. But while that sounds super far away, it's actually not. The distance between space bodies is usually measured in light years, and an astronomical unit is a much smaller unit of measurement. For context, the most distant thing detected from Earth is the galaxy GNZ11. Cute name, huh? It sits a staggering 32 billion light years away. Even so, our telescopes can still spot it. And just one light year is the same as 63,241 astronomical units. Woo! So, if our tech can detect a galaxy that's so far away, how have we not been able to uncover Planet X? Well, it's probably down to the fact that it might not even exist. The theory of Planet X was pretty much debunked back in 1989. It was discovered that the mysterious gravitational pulls of Neptune had been a red herring all along. Scientists had massively misjudged just how big Neptune actually was. Voyager 2 visited the planet and discovered its actual size. This new info explained the odd gravitational pulls, meaning they weren't being caused by the so-called Planet X. But that's not where our investigation ends, as the hypothetical ninth planet once again popped up around 10 years ago. While the evidence behind Lowell's theory was wrong, his belief in Planet X may not have been. In 2015, astronomers Michael Brown and Konstantin Batigin discovered that there were, in fact, unexplained gravitational forces at play past Neptune. There are satellites that orbit planets perpendicularly, which doesn't happen anywhere else in our solar system. There's also clusters of asteroids that move in very specific ways, so specific that it's basically impossible that it could be random. Even weirder, there are satellites that travel in completely opposite direction to the Sun, unlike most other things in the solar system. A planetoid called Sedna also appears to be being pulled towards something, along with six others, all going in the same direction. And Brown and Batigin aren't just any other stargazers. They're both well-respected scientists at the top of their game. Konstantin Batigin has been named in Forbes as one of 30 scientists who are changing the world. And Mike Brown was the man who rebranded Pluto as a dwarf planet. This means that when these guys say something, it's usually pretty legit, and you should probably listen. But the only way we can really prove Planet X exists is to actually find it. 
and this has turned out to be pretty difficult. To locate the planet, we'd need to use a method called transit photometry. This is basically where we monitor a whole bunch of stars for a long time and look out for any dips in the light they give off. These dips would likely be caused by a planet getting in the way. And ta-da! The existence of Planet X could be proved. But for this method to work, Earth, the new planet, and the Sun all have to be perfectly aligned. These circumstances are pretty rare. And if these conditions don't exist, the dip in light won't happen. Plus, this method would only really work with planets that are closer to the Sun than our Earth. That's Venus and Mercury. For anything past Earth, this technique is pretty much useless. Another technique we could use is to find the potential planet through a good old-fashioned telescope. But as you can imagine, that's insanely tricky. The furthest object that we've found in our solar system is a planetoid, appropriately named, far, far out. But that's only 140 AU away from the Sun. That's only like a quarter of the way to Planet X. We can only see an object because of its brightness. The Sun is very visible to us because it emits huge amounts of light. And we can see the Moon because it reflects the Sun's light. Technically, the Moon has no right to appear brighter than everything else in the night sky. It only seems brighter because we're closer to it. The farther away an object is, the less bright it appears to us. The major issue with seeing the theoretical Planet X is that all objects in our solar system get their light from the Sun. They reflect sunlight, and that's why we can see them. Given how far away from the Sun Planet X might be, it makes it nearly impossible to see. And because of its really dim light, to view it, we would require perfect weather conditions as well as an extremely strong telescope. But Brown and Badigeon have found the perfect one. The Subaru Telescope is located at the top of a dormant volcano in Hawaii. It's huge and is capable of capturing even the weakest light from distant space objects. The issue that we need to figure out is where to point it. Without knowing where Planet X actually is, this basically turns things into a giant guessing game. There are also only around three nights every year when the conditions are clear enough to see the hypothetical Planet X. It's difficult, but not impossible. And still, most astronomers have called it a day and agreed that Planet X doesn't exist, stating that it's just a common myth. The most widespread explanation for the weird gravitational pulls is that there's a tiny black hole in our solar system. It's pulling the planets toward us. But don't worry. They say it's not big enough to actually munch on a planet. So Earth is all good, for now. The issue with the black hole theory is that, once again, it's almost impossible for us to track the thing down. While its mass could be as great as that of Planet X, the hole itself would be squished down to the size of an orange. Telescopes wouldn't be of any use. To find it, people would have to look for the gamma rays sent off by objects as they fall into the black hole. Another way we could find it is to release hundreds of tiny spacecraft. They would pass close enough to the hypothetical hole, and when they got pulled toward it, we could probably detect it. But don't count out Brown and Badigeon's theory. It's still being documented by NASA. And until we find unmistakable evidence to prove any theories, Planet X might still be out there. For thousands of years, people knew only about the planets Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn which they could see using simple telescopes, or even by the naked eye, if conditions were good. But in the late 18th century, a famous astronomer named Sir William Herschel discovered a new planet that was icy blue in color. At first, people thought it was a star, but later they realized it was a planet. Today, we know it as Uranus, a planet that's more than 19 times farther away from the Sun than Earth. It's so far away that it takes Uranus 84 years to complete one trip around the Sun. This astronomer also discovered many other interesting things in space, like double stars and nebulae. In the mid-1800s, scientists noticed something pulled Uranus and strangely tugged its orbit. They thought there must be another planet out there, 
and they used math to predict where it would be. Finally, in 1846, they found Neptune using a telescope. It was too faint to see with the naked eye because it was too far away from the sun. It was all so exciting. Who knows how many other planets could be there lurking in the darkness of our solar system. Back in the mid-1800s, astronomers noticed something unusual was happening in the sky. A small rocky planet named Mercury was behaving strangely. It didn't follow the predictable orbit that was expected of it. One of the astronomers was a brilliant French scientist named Urbain Le Verrier. He came up with a theory that there could be another planet in our solar system no one had yet discovered. It would be located somewhere between Mercury and the Sun. This hypothetical planet, which he named Vulcan after the Roman god of fire, would have an incredibly hot surface. And it could be a potential explanation for Mercury's strange behavior. He never surely claimed Vulcan was really the one thing disturbing the orbit of Mercury. But, excited by the possibility of discovering a new planet, astronomers all over the world took the idea of Vulcan. For a planet that didn't exist, people committed to developing ideas and getting information about it. Some scientists didn't think it was likely that they had missed another planet as big as Mercury. It would have been hard not to see it by then. But there was a tiny chance of a smaller planet existing inside Mercury's orbit that was too close to the Sun so no one could see it. One theory said it was about 13 million miles away from the Sun. Mercury is the planet with the most eccentric orbit in our solar system, but the closest point it gets to the Sun is about 28.5 million miles. This means Vulcan would be under half of that distance. The theory moved on, saying that if Vulcan existed, it would orbit the Sun every 19 days and 18 hours, and its path would be tilted about 12 degrees relative to the path of other planets in our solar system. Vulcan's position at its furthest point from the Sun would still be too close to the Sun to be seen with the naked eye, even during twilight. The only chance of seeing Vulcan would be during a solar eclipse, or when it passed in front of the Sun, which, as the theory said, would be two to four times a year. They had a theory that this mysterious planet was so close to the Sun that it could only be seen during a total solar eclipse when the Moon blocked out the Sun's blinding glare. So, every time there was an eclipse, scientists would peer at the Sun, hoping to catch a glimpse of Vulcan. They were trying really hard, but no matter what, they couldn't find this mysterious planet. Some astronomers claimed to have spotted it during eclipses, but no one could ever confirm or find evidence for that. The theory of Vulcan was left waiting for some better times. Einstein had a different idea. You know about his theory of general relativity, right? That's where he claimed gravity wasn't some sort of natural force, but a result of space-time curved because of the presence of giant space objects, like planets and stars. Planets circle around the sun in their usual orbit because space-time is curved. That means the planets are kind of falling towards the central star of our solar system. And Einstein tried to explain Mercury's unusual orbit using his own theory of relativity. Unlike the other planets in our solar system, Mercury's orbit wasn't that circular. Instead, it seemed to wobble slightly, as if there was an invisible force pulling it away. Einstein said this could be happening because the massive gravity of our Sun was actually curving the fabric of space-time around it. He claimed it's possible this changed Mercury's orbit a little bit. It took the scientific community a while to test this theory, but it eventually seemed like the most plausible explanation. Even though Einstein's theory gave us a more elegant explanation for Mercury's strange orbit, some scientists were still holding out hope for Vulcan. It was especially hard to let go of the idea of Vulcan because Mercury is also the planet that's really hard to see from where we're standing. But later, more and more scientists started accepting Einstein's theory above their imagination. And they would observe a total solar eclipse specifically to test Einstein's theory of relativity, not because of Vulcan. And Vulcan is not the only hypothetical planet everyone was talking about. In the newer age, 
Some believe there could be a mysterious planet lurking in the outer part of our solar system. But this one is more likely to exist. No one has seen it directly yet, but computer simulations show this so-called Planet 9, or Planet X, is probably somewhere there beyond Neptune. Neptune and Planet X could be similar in size. Planet X could be 10 times more massive than Earth and circles around our Sun in an elongated shape, which is on average 20 times farther from the Sun than Neptune. A year there may last between 10,000 to 20,000 Earth years. By comparison, a year on Neptune lasts 165 Earth years. Something this big moving out there beyond Neptune could explain the unusual orbits of smaller objects in the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is the area of our solar system beyond Neptune and where it orbits. And there are most likely many asteroids, comets, and some other smaller bodies there, mostly made of ice. There was another hypothetical planet called Nibiru. Remember those rumors that the world could end back in 2012? One of the popular scenarios was Nibiru which some claimed would hit our home planet at the end of the year. Of course, nothing happened. We're still here, all set and good, but the idea of Nibiru seemed interesting. Stories started in the 1970s when a man named Zachariah Sitchin mentioned Nibiru in his book, The Twelfth Planet, claiming it orbits the sun every 3,600 years. But there's no chance a planet with such an eccentric orbit wouldn't disrupt other planets in our solar system with its gravity. And if it was really coming that close to Earth in 2012, we were supposed to be able to see it with the naked eye. Some simple calculations showed Nibiru would have been nearly as bright as Mars at its dimmest and brighter than the faintest stars you see from a city. Oh well, maybe we'll have more luck in the next 3,500 and something years. In 2011, a comet named Elenin appeared that many people thought could be Nibiru. But when you're looking at comets and planets through a telescope, you see they appear differently. A comet has a coma, which is a gas atmosphere, together with a tail, something a planet doesn't have. Plus, this comet didn't slam into the Earth. It came too close to our Sun and fell apart. The leftover pieces will continue moving on their way to the outer solar system for the next 12,000 years. We've discovered Kepler 22b, a small exoplanet in the Cygnus constellation. Seems like nothing important, right? But it's actually a big deal. This is the first planet located in the habitable zone that was found by the Kepler telescope. In other words, there may be water on this planet, and if there's water, there may be life. Kepler 22b can become our new potential home, so let's take a closer look at it. Actually, discovering new planets is not easy at all. Not all of them can be seen through our super cool telescopes, even the almighty Hubble. Sometimes, the stars are so small and dim that it's really hard to find them on a map. The same thing happened with Kepler 22. In such cases, scientists have to use a special method. First, they take a bunch of photos of the star in different periods of time. Then, they look at them and think, hmm, are there any dark dots on this star somewhere? And if they find one, that might be a planet. These photos actually help us to discover some very important stuff. Like, first of all, this planet exists. Secondly, here is its size, radius, and proximity to the star. And finally, will we be able to live there? Now we know that Kepler 22b is very similar to our planet and could potentially become a second Earth. It's also very close to us, only 635 light years away. Yeah, it's about three quadrillion miles, but this is one of the closest options. Kepler 22, the star of Kepler 22b, is a yellow dwarf. It's very, very similar to our Sun. The same size, the same radius, even the age is almost the same, 4 billion years. The difference is only in luminosity. It's about 20% dimmer than the Sun. So, no matter how much you strain your eyes, you won't see this star in the night sky. The planet Kepler-22b 
is about 2.4 times larger than our Earth, and that's pretty good. More radius means more potential water and space to live. Although going from one city to another would take a while. It's scary to even imagine a three-day long plane flight. We don't know the exact mass of this planet, but scientists think it's bigger than Earth's. Actually, the mass of Kepler-22b can be up to 36 times greater than that of our planet. What does it mean? Vigorous gravity. If the planet is 36 times heavier than Earth, then gravity there will be about six times stronger. Can you barely lift 20 pounds of potatoes? Try 120. Not to mention that you yourself can become much heavier on that planet. You'll have to get incredibly pumped up just to walk there. You have to literally turn yourself into a bodybuilder just to get to work. The worst thing is that with such gravity, it'd be incredibly difficult for plants to survive there. They'd need at least a little freedom to rise up from the ground. And animals. Our dogs and cats would have to turn into little balls of muscle to survive there. But if this planet has its own animals or other inhabitants, we can roughly imagine what they may look like. They probably have a lot of legs to make moving easier. They aren't really tall, but they're very massive and extremely strong. Hmm, muscular giant spiders? Could be worse, I guess. The good news is that this is all unconfirmed information. If we're very lucky and gravity there turns out to be just a bit stronger than Earth's, then, of course, it'll be much easier to live there. The next thing we know about Kepler-22b is that it's about 15% closer to its star than we are to the Sun. If Kepler-22b existed in our solar system, it would be located somewhere between Earth and Venus. Does that mean we're all going to burn? No, silly. As I mentioned before, the star Kepler-22 is pretty cold, just some 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's why we can assume that the temperatures on Kepler-22b will be about the same as we have on Earth. If the planet orbits its star the same way Earth orbits the Sun, which we don't actually know, Kepler-22b can rotate around its star on its side, like, for example, Uranus. What? Didn't you know Uranus is actually lying on its side? Also, look at its rings. Yes, Uranus also has rings, like Saturn, but they're vertical. The universe is truly a mysterious place. So, if Kepler-22b is really something like that, then the weather on the planet will be, to put it mildly, not very good. Incredibly cold winters will be regularly followed by hot summers. And, just like with tidally locked planets, we'd be able to live more or less comfortably only on the narrow piece of land between these two crazy sides. Let's hope that this is not the case and the planet rotates normally. But it's not all that bad. Studies show that there may be an ocean on Kepler-22b. You already know that water means life. But in this case, it's also a big plus because a planet covered by an ocean always has more stable temperatures. The water absorbs some of the heat and distributes it evenly across the planet. The hot parts cool down and the icy ones warm up. By the way, that's exactly what happened to Earth billions of years ago. When our planet started getting its first little puddles, our beloved moon helped these puddles to spread all over the planet. Thanks to this, a burning horror that used to be our Earth turned into a cute little ball full of life. So if Kepler-22b has water but no atmosphere, scientists think that the average temperature there could be around 12 degrees Fahrenheit. But if there's also an Earth-like atmosphere, then the temperature can reach 72 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be nice. And finally, one year there is equal to 290 Earth days, about nine months. The planet has no natural satellites, so unfortunately, we'd have to say goodbye to a beautiful view of the moon. On the bright side, we'd probably be able to see the sun as a distant little star. We could admire it in the night sky, remembering our home, while not hiding from giant spiders. And this is all that we know at the moment. Unfortunately, it's quite difficult to explore such planets, so there's a lot of very important data that we don't know. For example, what kind of planet is this anyway? Yep, 
We're missing the most important information about Kepler-22b. We don't know if it's a rocky planet or not. And if not, then all the previously mentioned information means nothing. It may turn out to be a gas planet, or a planet covered with gas but with a solid core, like Neptune, or a water world covered with a giant ocean. In this case, it better be a water planet. Then at least we could build some kind of underwater city there. We could filter the water and eat fish until we evolve into an amphibious species. Does it even count as evolution if we go back to our roots? Scientists, however, think that Kepler-22b may turn out to be a Neptune-like planet. Some astronomers have even assigned the planet to a category of mini-Neptunes. Yes, this is a real planetary category. But this hasn't been proven yet. But even if, fortunately for us, Kepler-22b turns out to be a rocky planet, we still don't know what the atmosphere is like there. Does it exist at all? What if it turns out to be something like the atmosphere of Venus? which is more toxic than your ex. Then we'd have to dig deep underground to somehow survive on this planet. And then we'd have to come up with a heat source, because it's pretty cold underground. Yeah, let's hope this won't be the case. There are many possibilities with Kepler-22b. So far, we don't have a clear answer. But let's hope that scientists will find it before we load the first people into shuttles and send them to conquer Kepler-22b. That would be awkward if it turns out to be a gas planet, or something like that. We're traveling through space at the speed of light. The route from Earth to the Sun at that speed will take only 8 minutes, but it would take us about 35 years to reach our destination, which is, by the way, still very fast. By comparison, a conventional rocket would take about 600,000 years to make the journey. And here we are. It's a star system suspiciously very similar to our own. And our scientists suspect that life could exist here, just like on Earth. A red dwarf, 30% the size and weight of the Sun, lies at the heart of this star system. But these are the planets orbiting the star that interest us most. The first of these is L9859b. Its size is somewhere between Earth and Mars, but it's very light. It's only half the mass of Venus. But life is impossible on this rocky planet. It's too close to the star, and it's so hot, you'd burn a cake if you tried baking it on its surface. It's about 100 degrees higher than the maximum of your oven. The planet makes a complete circle around its host star in just two days, compared to 365 for Earth. And it gets 22 times more energy than we get from the sun. So it's not only hot there, but there's a lot of dangerous radiation. The next planet is 2.8 million miles from its host star. That's 13 times closer than the distance from Mercury to the Sun. And it makes a complete revolution around the star in 3.7 days. But what's interesting is that the planet is 30% bigger than the Earth and twice as heavy. So it belongs to the class of super-Earth planets. Such planets can be rich in water ice, methane, and hydrogen. These are some of the elements that are necessary for life's existence. Many scientists believe that it's on such planets that extraterrestrial civilizations can live. But because of the great weight of the planet, it has a strong gravitational force. So these civilizations may not be able to fly into space because it's harder for them to get out of the gravitational trap of a super-Earth planet. However, life isn't possible here because the planet is still too close to the host star. And just like in our solar system, the two nearest planets are too hot. But the third planet looks more promising. L9859d. It's almost twice as heavy as the Earth and 50% bigger. Scientists have calculated that about a third of its mass could be water. For comparison, the mass of all water on Earth is only 0.02%. The presence of water is the main condition for the emergence of life but we can only guess where the water might be. It could be on the surface, but high temperatures can turn large oceans into giant clouds of steam. But water can also be contained in the groundwater below the surface. Well, we can't know that for sure yet. Let's move on to the next planet in the star system. This newly discovered planet is of the Super Venus class, L9859e. It's a rocky planet three times the size of Earth, the Super Venus class means that the planet is heavy enough to have an atmosphere, 
But the conditions there are more like a greenhouse. Different gases fill the atmosphere there. Star rays pass through them to the planet's surface, reflect off it, and rise upward. But the dense gases don't let them leave the atmosphere, so the planet gets hotter and hotter. This is the greenhouse effect that we try so hard to avoid on Earth. On top of that, the stellar wind carries water vapor and other elements from the upper layers of the atmosphere into outer space. Life cannot exist on such a planet, nor could it ever originate, just like on Earth's twin sister, Venus. So far, all the planets we've looked at are outside the habitable zone of the host star. That's the sweet spot at a perfect distance from the star. Not too close, so that the planet isn't too hot and the water there doesn't evaporate instantly. And not too far away, so that the planet doesn't look like a cold desert. And planets B, C, D, and E are too close to the host star. But there's another hypothetical planet F in this star system, located right in this sweet spot. This super Earth candidate is 2.5 times heavier than our home planet. So we have hopes that it's a rocky world, just like the other planets in this star system. The weight of planet F is enough to have a dense atmosphere, and the temperature on its surface should be suitable for water to exist there in liquid form. The planet makes a complete circle around its host star in 23 days, which literally means it's New Year every three weeks. It isn't very likely, though, that there's a civilization there that celebrates it. Indeed, the very existence of this planet is very doubtful because we still have no direct evidence. All the other planets have been discovered by the transit method. That's when we point our telescopes directly at a star and watch its brightness change. When there's a slight drop in the star's brightness, that's when a planet has passed between us and the star, like this dot. We have a short period of time while the planet is in the background of the star to determine its size and speed. Sometimes we can observe such transits of Mercury and Venus on the solar disk. And there are at least 29 potentially habitable planets out there in distant space that can observe Earth in the same way. About 1,715 stars within a few hundred light years are perfectly located for it. Each star has planets around it, but only 29 of them are in the habitable zone. So there really could be life and an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization out there. If so, they could point their telescopes toward the sun and see a small dot pass across the solar disk. And they could have been making these observations for at least the last 5,000 years so they could see how our civilization was born and how we evolved. Moreover, these planets are close enough to pick up our radio signals and even television broadcasts. But it works both ways. Radio signals travel through space at the speed of light. We mastered this technology about 100 years ago. So if there really is a civilization out there somewhere, we would pick up their signals too. But so far, it hasn't happened so we have no proof of the existence of life on these planets. The discovery of a star system like L9859 is very important to us because we're always looking for life outside of our solar system. And super Earth-class planets are even better suited for the origin of life than planet Earth itself. Such planets are sometimes called super habitable. So some scientists think that Earth is a good place for life, but not the best. Super habitable planets would have to be 30% larger than Earth and twice as heavy. This would create stronger gravity, which would make the atmosphere on the planet denser and with a higher concentration of oxygen. This in turn would raise the average temperature on the planet to a perfect 77 degrees Fahrenheit, so plants would thrive there. Also, stronger gravity makes the surface of the planet flatter, so there might be more oceans there than on Earth. This would make aquatic life much more diverse. The host star also plays a very important role. It should be smaller than the sun. The bigger the star, the more of its fuel it burns. This means that the lifespan of such stars is much shorter. For example, the lifespan of the sun is about 10 billion years, but a red dwarf can live up to 30 billion years. More time, more opportunity for the birth of life and evolution. So far, scientists have discovered 24 superabundant planets, but that still doesn't mean that there is life there for real. But some scientists believe that there are already at least 36 advanced civilizations in our galaxy, besides Earth. They've searched for similar worlds on the star map. First, 
we find stars that look like the Sun among about 100 billion stars throughout the galaxy. Now we choose from them those that are rich in iron. Such stars burn at the perfect temperature and help the planets around them gain an iron core and become Earth-like. Now let's pick relatively young stars from this pile, because when they get older, they expand and either absorb the planets around them or burn them up. One last thing, let's find planets in this pile that are in the habitable zone of the star. And voila! 36 worlds may be inhabited by some unknown civilization. But we won't know for sure until we get in touch with them. You take off from Earth and park your spacecraft somewhere near the moon. You're now almost 240,000 miles away from your home planet. That's almost 100 widths of the United States. Now you take out a giant hammer and an enormous chisel using the robotic arms of your spaceship. You place the chisel at the Earth's North Pole and strike its head with the hammer. Earth splits open like an eggshell, and you see it, another planet. It's Thea, and it's hiding inside our planet like a yolk in an egg. You'd need to go back in time 4.5 billion years to find out how it got there. This beautiful nebula will soon become our solar system. Colored dust and various space debris are slowly coming closer toward the common center. Soon this jigsaw puzzle of debris becomes too heavy and dense. The temperature inside the giant is rising. Soon it gets so high that it triggers a nuclear chain reaction. Another second and BAM! There's an explosion so powerful that the shock waves travel far into dark space. And the blinding flash from this blast can be seen from the other side of the Milky Way galaxy. When the dust clears a little, you can see that a bright light is still shining at the very center of the explosion. This newborn star is the Sun. It weighs as much as 333,000 Earths. If the Sun was a bucket, you'd need 1.3 million Earth-sized planets to fill it. You're interested in a small object over there, 93 million miles away from the Sun. This pile of rocks and hot lava is Earth. Right now, the planet is busy forming its core, while the oceans of lava are gradually cooling down. But a few tens of million years after the Sun's birth, you notice a strange object hurtling toward Earth. It's Thea. This small planet was born at about the same time as Earth, and now it's following a crazy spiral trajectory at enormous speed. Scientists believe Thea was kind of a ball Jupiter and Venus played with. Venus was pulling Thea in one direction, then Big Brother Jupiter pulled it back. But the Sun makes up 99.8% of the mass of the entire solar system. That's why the star sets its own rules. It makes Thea move in almost the same orbit as Earth. So they inevitably come closer and closer to each other until they become next-door neighbors. We see that Thea is the size of Mars and as wide as the Atlantic Ocean from New York to Portugal. A collision can't be avoided. Thea is traveling toward Earth at nearly 9,000 miles per hour. That's 11 times faster than the speed of sound. If the smaller planet crashes into Earth at a particular angle, Earth will most likely be torn apart, as well as Thea itself. The collision will cause a huge blast, visible on other planets even on a bright day. Nothing will be left but some burning dust and debris. Even if Thea touches Earth only lightly, it'll still knock out a chunk of our planet the size of Australia. But the collision with Thea happens at a perfect 45-degree angle. It strikes the Earth at tremendous speed. The explosion literally vaporizes huge amounts of rock, and the shock wave sends the remaining debris into Earth's orbit. A huge crater is formed at the impact site. Soon, it gets filled with boiling lava. The remnants of Thea and the ejected fragments of Earth begin to orbit our planet. According to one version, these fragments form two moons. At first, they travel together, but one day, they get too close to each other and collide, forming one large space body. The other theory claims that all the shards start being pulled by the remnants of Thea. Sometime later, they form the moon as we now know it. At that point in the past, though, it's just red-hot rock and lava. The collision at this angle slightly tilts our planet and accelerates its rotation. It's because of Thea that we have different seasons and 24 hours in a day. Earth has lithospheric plates. These are enormous solid pieces that make up the crust of our planet. 
After the collision with Thea, they start to break and crack. It causes carbon, a primary component of all known life on Earth, to start moving all over our planet. So, Earth gets some kind of metabolism. After a few hundred million years, the first living creatures start to appear on our planet. Over nearly 4 billion years, simple single-celled organisms have been evolving into the life you see today. According to scientists, such a collision is a very rare event. The probability that somewhere out there, there's a planet like ours that has survived the same catastrophe is extremely small. This may be the reason why we are yet to find traces of other civilizations out there in space. Meanwhile, the remains of Thea are still here on Earth. Of course, it doesn't look like an entire planet stuck inside our own. Most of the fragments have melted and blended into the Earth's crust. If you take the top layer off our planet, you'll see two huge lava blobs the size of entire continents. They're right below Africa and the Pacific Ocean. Presumably, these are the remains of Thea. They didn't mix with Earth's mantle because of different densities. It's like mixing water and oil in a glass. The oil will always float up over the water and create an even layer on top of it. But if you raise those lava patches up to the surface, they'd be 100 times higher than Mount Everest. Other remains of Thea might be on the moon. The Apollo space missions brought back many soil samples for analysis. Scientists have concluded that the moon is very similar to Earth in structure. People could drill deep down and take samples there. Then they'd analyze the blobs from Earth. If their structure matched, it'd be 100% proof that Thea did hit Earth 4.5 billion years ago. And that's how we got the moon. But for the time being, Thea remains somewhat mysterious. Scientists are still not sure that the planet actually existed. The whole idea perfectly fits the model of the moon's creation. But in fact, this incredible collision may have never happened. Hop on the bright side of life together with our brand new tees, hoodies, and more. Click the link to pick your choice. Now you travel 41 light years away from Earth to the planet 55 Cancri E. It's about twice the size of Earth and eight times heavier. You take out your giant hammer again and use it to hit the chisel. The planet cracks and you see it's a giant diamond. The temperature on this planet is tens of times higher than that of Earth and its soil is rich in carbon. The heat puts a lot of pressure on this carbon. Its structure changes. First, it turns into graphite. Some more pressure, and graphite turns into diamond. On Earth, diamonds form at depths below 60 miles, where the pressure is 50,000 times greater than on the surface. The temperatures there rise over 1,000 degrees, which is as hot as fire. Diamonds are ejected closer to the surface in volcanic eruptions. Still, People have to dig mines 1,500 feet deep to find these beautiful gems. The Golden Jubilee Diamond is the biggest cut and faceted diamond on Earth. It weighs as much as a chocolate bar and is the size of a hamster. Its price is about $12 million. Now imagine a diamond the size of an entire planet. You decide to fly back to the solar system. Your destination is Jupiter's moon, Europa. It's as wide as the distance between Seattle and Houston, and its mass is less than 1% the mass of Earth. Its surface is enclosed in an icy crust. It's about 19 miles thick. But what if you crack this crust with your giant hammer? Wow, Europa is completely covered in water. It's freezing here, three times colder than at the North Pole on Earth. The water turns into ice almost instantly, but the ocean beneath the surface is still liquid. Europa interacts with Jupiter gravitationally, just like the Moon with Earth. This creates tidal forces and heats Europa's core. The core melts the ice around it. The result is a huge ocean, two to three times larger than all of Earth's oceans combined. Scientists believe that water is the basis of life. It may mean that life may exist on Europa. There could be thermal springs, just like at the bottom of our oceans. The water there is probably much warmer. And even though the pressure and temperature in such places are likely to be extreme, simple bacteria may live there. Europa is almost the same age as Earth. This means there has been enough time for living organisms to appear and evolve. Who knows, maybe some advanced civilization is already blooming under this crust of ice. They may be building big cities and dreaming of conquering space right now. But the only thing people can do at the moment is send a probe to Europa 
and find out if life is possible there. Today, we're going to work our core, so get ready to sweat. Oops, sorry, wrong core. Hey, we've traveled far and wide, down to the Earth's inner core and up into outer space. But what if we could combine these adventures and find out what hides in the innards of other planets and moons in the solar system? With the help of this interstellar hyperdrill, we can achieve that, at least in part. Coordinates are in, all systems ready, and our first destination is… the moon. Our moon, in fact. We land on its gray and desolate surface under the black sky. No blue here, because there's very little atmosphere to disperse the light. The drill starts working, and we first go through the outer layer of the moon, the crust, just like on Earth. We're on the sunny side, so the thickness of this layer is only 43 miles. But were we to land on the dark side, it would be more than twice as thick. The moon is a rocky body, so its crust is largely made of silicon, iron, aluminum, calcium, oxygen, and magnesium, with much smaller amounts of other elements. Further down, we find the mantle, and it's a long and tenuous journey through. This layer is about 850 miles thick. It gets hotter as we go deeper, finding composite minerals, peroxine and olivine. They're made of iron, silicon, oxygen, and magnesium in different proportions. Finally, we break through the hard layers and into the semi-molten outer core. Another journey of about 93 miles ahead through this scalding swamp. And we dive into the iron ocean of the liquid core shell. It's nearly 60 miles thick, and the molten metal threatens to evaporate us. But this drill was made to sustain an extremely heavy onslaught. And that's how we finally come to a sudden halt. In the deepest reaches of the moon, there's a solid iron core, which is 150 miles thick. We could drill through it, but it would be unnecessary. So we just set the flag here and skip to the next planet on our drilling list. And it's Mercury! It was hot deep inside the moon, but on the surface of the smallest planet in the system, it's even hotter. That's because it's so close to the sun, of course. All right, let's drill. Mercury has a pretty thick outer shell, which is both crust and mantle, going about 250 miles deep. Not the most fascinating journey. It's not unlike the Earth in many respects. But then, the drill stops, ramming into a solid metal wall. It's Mercury's core, which has a diameter of over 2,500 miles. It takes up to 85% of the planet's overall diameter. No use trying to drill through this one. It's fully metal and extremely dense. Skipping to the next planet. And we're on Mars now. Oh look, it's sunset here. And the sun is making the sky hazy blue. But you know the drill. I mean, we're here to drill. So that's what we do. Mars's crust is quite thin compared to Earth's. Just 6 to 30 miles deep. Its composition is much the same though. Iron, aluminum, calcium, potassium, and magnesium. That's one of the reasons why humans are looking to colonize the red planet one day. It's very similar to our own. We're very quick to drill through the first layer, and the second one, the mantle, is now upon us. It's a hard and rocky layer about 1,100 miles thick. Thanks to its size, Mars isn't seismically active any longer. There's simply no magma boiling close underneath the surface of the planet, making it silent and docile. It's a long dig, but we finally come to a screeching halt bumping into the core. A ball of iron, nickel, and sulfur with a diameter of 2,000 to 2,600 miles. This core is bigger than that of Mercury, but the planet itself is larger too, so it figures. Okay then, our next stop is even more interesting, because it's… Jupiter. This gas giant has a mass twice that of all the other planets in the solar system combined. And we landed right in the middle of an ocean. The ocean, I dare say, it's the largest one in the whole system, and it's made of liquid hydrogen. The drill goes smoothly through the surface of the planet because there's no rock or hard metal here, only gas and liquid. But the shaking, yikes! The pressure on this planet is more than just huge, it's unimaginable. The drill is barely able to withstand it, and as it's going deeper, the pressure's becoming higher too. We've reached Jupiter's core, and it's nearly too much to bear. The temperature here is about 90,000 degrees Fahrenheit, and the core itself is not solid but liquid as well, kept together by the immense pressure from all sides. 
The drill starts to rattle. Bad sign. Let's get out of here before it breaks. Whew. No winds, no pressure, no heat. All around us is a vast, icy wasteland, crisscrossed by ridges and reddish bands. It's Europa, one of Jupiter's most promising moons. As we drill through the ice, let me explain. Europa is one of the candidates to have extraterrestrial life in the solar system, and it can be found right beneath the icy shell through which we're now digging. It's only 10 to 15 miles thick, while down below is an enormous saltwater ocean, twice bigger than all of Earth's oceans combined. The deepest point on Earth is Challenger Deep, and it's a bit over 6 miles down. The ocean on Europa, on the other hand, can be up to 100 miles deep. Who knows what can be lurking in that deep, dark sea? Anyway, we travel fast through the water and finally reach the bottom of the ocean. The mantle starts here, and it's made of rock, just like on Earth. And not much deeper in, we find the metal core of the moon. Europa is a little smaller than Earth's moon, so it's no surprise we reach its center pretty fast. Okay, skip drive on. Let's go further. Oh, I'd rather we drill in as fast as we can. Just look around, it's blazing here. We're definitely on Io, another moon of Jupiter, and the most volcanically active world in the solar system. Look, that volcano is twice the size of Everest, and it's erupting right now. Thankfully, we're under Io's surface already. But that's not to say we're safe. It's all molten down here too, mostly yellow and brownish hue, due to the huge amounts of sulfur. The stench must be horrible. Anyway, the most peculiar feature is that both inside and outside, everything's always on the move on Io. Jupiter and its other moons create tremendous tidal forces, making the surface of Io swell over 300 feet up and down. Like the largest tsunamis on Earth, only here it's not water, but rock. The deeper we go, the calmer it gets, though, until we're finally at the iron core. It's still hot here, but at least there's no shaking and swelling like above. Let's put up another flag and go to the next point. And that would be Saturn, the second largest planet of the solar system and the one best known for its spectacular rings. Not the only one to have them at all, mind you, but we'll get to it. Now, as you've surely noticed, our drill is simply falling down through the gaseous hydrogen and helium, making up most of the planet's surface and atmosphere. No need to work here. Just wait and hope the immense pressure won't crush our drill to a hunk of junk. At last, the pressures become so enormous that we find ourselves in the liquid hydrogen, and here we start diving. Soon we'll reach the solid core of Saturn. Ah, here we are. It's made of iron and nickel and is actually quite small compared to the rest of the planet. Well, the last destination awaits, so come on! And here we come, Neptune. The drill immediately deploys anchors, because the winds here are extremely powerful. They reach speeds five times greater than the most devastating hurricanes on Earth. Neptune is covered in a pretty thin layer of hydrogen and helium, just like Saturn or Jupiter. But underneath, there's much more than that. It's hot, windy, and lonely here on the outskirts of the solar system. So let's dig already. Beneath the gases, there's suddenly a bubbling hot mass of water, methane, and ammonia. Pew! These substances are hot, despite Neptune being called an ice giant. The name comes from its core. Deep inside, where we're quickly headed right now, a small ball of rock and ice sits all alone. And despite the boiling temperatures above, the ice beneath is ever cold. When you explode planets, things get red hot. Atmospheres are stripped away. Stuff is flying apart. Everything collapses. The world becomes brighter than a dozen suns. You squeeze your eyes shut and cover your ears. Your hair stands on end. The sheer power of a cosmic blast is terrifying. Some time before the explosion, you're hovering in almost complete darkness. Below, you see the moon or what you think looks like the moon. The surface of this light-colored sphere is pockmarked with craters left by meteorites. You see huge, steep hills stretching for miles. It's Mercury, and right now, you're going to explode it. As if in slow-mo, you watch the planet fall apart. And then, in the blink of an eye, 
you see a wall of debris closing in on you. First, giant chunks of rock. Those are all that's left of the planet's solid crust and rocky mantle. The appearance and structure of the debris flying in your direction changes. Now, the stuff looks liquid, like splashes of quicksilver. That's Mercury's metallic core bursting apart. It used to take up 85% of the planet's volume. And finally, it's a firework of solid pieces again. It's the planet's solid core. The explosion is so powerful, it knocks Earth into a different orbit. The sun hiccups and swallows down an enormous cloud of dust. That's everything Mercury has left behind. But don't worry, our solar system won't lose any planets. This whole explosion thing is only a temporary experiment. Once you're done watching the show, you press another button and the planet gets back together, as if you've hit rewind. You approach the next planet on your way. Its surface is hiding under a super dense atmosphere made up of carbon dioxide. If you decided to land on Venus, you'd watch thick clouds of sulfuric acid pass by. You'd see the planet's surface, reddish brown, dry, and incredibly hot. You'd probably walk across flat, smooth plains, covering two-thirds of the planet's surface. You'd gawk at volcanoes littering Venus, all 1,600 of them. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do that, because you press the button. Boom! Huge chunks of basalt fly away from the center of the explosion. That used to be the planet's 12-mile-thick crust. Then you spot bright burning meteors flying towards you at incredible speed. Those are chunks of Venus's molten rocky mantle. The fire rain seems endless, maybe because the mantle was 1,200 miles thick. But that's not the most massive part of the planet. The power of the explosion forces apart Venus's metallic iron core. This core used to be twice as wide as the mantle. You reach the blue marble of your home planet. What will its insides look like, scattered in space? From above, Earth looks pretty. 71% of its surface is blue, because of all that water, seas, and oceans. There are also areas of green, yellow, and brown and white swirls. You press the button. The planet bursts apart in a hailstorm of rocks. They're what's left from Earth's thin crust and much, much thicker mantle. It used to take up nearly 84% of the entire planet's volume. You see the rocky rain change into something way more liquid. It's scorching hot iron and nickel that used to make up Earth's outer core. The metals weren't under enough pressure to be solid. The bang is so powerful that it takes apart Earth's inner core. It used to be a solid ball of iron and nickel. After the pieces fly apart, they follow their own orbits around the sun. The most massive chunks crash into the moon, and some travel further and get swallowed by our star. You can't linger. The red planet is waiting for you. The surface of Mars is covered with rusty colored dust. The thickness of the dust layer varies from area to area, but in most places, it's seven feet thick. The ground is colored gold, brown, tan, and even greenish. The hue depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Bang! Mars is a rocky planet. You have to dodge mountain-sized chunks of crust made up of volcanic basalt rock. What you see next looks as if you've blown up huge amounts of soft, rocky toothpaste. That used to be Mars's mantle, composed of oxygen, silicates, and other minerals. And then, the flying pieces get solid again. Ah, it's the planet's core's turn. It was solid, made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur. Billions and trillions of fragments of all sizes, from a small moon to pieces several feet wide, get launched in all directions. But only very few parts have enough momentum to leave the solar system. The whole event slightly changes Earth's orbit, and the temperature on our planet goes up by 18 degrees Fahrenheit. You leave rocky planets behind and close in on the first gas giant on your way. It's Jupiter. Thick brown, yellow, red, and white clouds hide its surface. 
they make the planet look colorful and beautifully striped. You hit the button. This time, the view is different. Instead of chunks of solid crust, you see jet streams of gas accelerating from the planet's center. It's what used to be Jupiter's atmosphere, made up of hydrogen and helium gas. In no time, the matter hurtling away to space turns liquid. That's hydrogen changing its form under immense atmospheric pressure closer to the center of the planet. A bit later, the liquid is already a mixture of metallic hydrogen and helium. And finally, something solid. It was probably Jupiter's core, 14 to 18 times the mass of Earth. The gas giant's diameter was about 90,000 miles, but the blast lasts no more than half a second. The explosion of Jupiter is so strong, it evaporates smaller planets like Mars and Earth. The Sun remains pretty much untouched. It gets hotter and kind of unstable for a bit, but it doesn't last long. The next gas giant on your way is Saturn. At first sight, it looks as if the planet has a surface. The seemingly solid yellowish-brown sphere is surrounded by layers of clouds. Saturn's trademark rings are awesome and colorful, gray, beige, and tan. They're actually groups of tiny ringlets that are made up of floating chunks of water, ice, rocks, and dust. These chunks range in size from specks to massive skyscraper-sized pieces. While orbiting Saturn, they keep colliding, and larger pieces get shattered. You're surprised to see that the rings aren't perfectly round. They have bends, caused by the gravitational pull from the nearby moons. 53 of them are confirmed. Titan, an icy world bigger than our moon, and even Mercury, is the largest. What you see looks eerily similar to what happened when you exploded Jupiter. There's only one difference. Saturn's rings break apart, sending rocks and ice flying into space at incredible speed. The largest pieces crash with the planet's moons, wiping away the smallest of them. You see streams of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium, with a bit of methane, ammonia, and water. They're moving at breakneck speed away from where the center of the planet used to be. After that, splashes of liquid matter, that's liquid hydrogen, that later turns metallic. And finally, the chunks of the solid core made up of rocky materials. You're looking at a beautiful blue-green sphere of the ice giant Uranus. The planet gets this unusual hue when the light from the sun gets reflected off the planet's surface. Plus, Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, with traces of methane gas that absorb the red light. Anyway, bang! This time, it's massive blobs of ice that are hurtling in your direction first. They used to be the part of the planet's ice mantle that once made up 80% of the planet's volume. But why does this ice look liquid? On Uranus, frozen liquid isn't solid like on Earth. Ice is a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia ice, and methane. It's often called the water ammonia ocean. After the bizarre ice rain, you see solid pieces of the planet's rocky core. It used to be small, no more than half the Earth's mass. Some of Uranus's moons get pulverized in the explosion, and several even get ejected out of the solar system. The explosion also slightly shifts Neptune's orbit. And the last planet on your way, Neptune. It looks blue because of a layer of swirling gas and permanent clouds. No time to linger. Boom! The planet doesn't have a solid surface. That's why, after pressing the button, you see Neptune's liquid mantle bursting. It looks like a water-filled balloon thrown down from the 50th floor. This sends splashes of water, ammonia, and methane ices away into space. It's followed by lava-like remains of the planet's mantle. It used to be liquid, red-hot, and rich in methane, ammonia, and water. That's what's left from Neptune's solid core made up of iron and other metals. We've been focusing on trying to find life on Mars so much, while there is this gem waiting to be explored. This planet is the sixth farthest from the Sun and the second largest in the solar system. You'll find it right behind Jupiter. I'm talking about Saturn, or as they sometimes call it, the jewel of the solar system. It's so different from our planet. First of all, you wouldn't be able to stand there. While Earth consists of rock and other tough stuff, this planet is like a giant ball, 
mostly made of gases. If you found a swimming pool huge enough to fit Saturn, you could see the planet floating in the water. No wonder, Saturn is the least dense planet in the solar system. It also contains a lot of helium. You know, the gas you put in balloons to make them hover in the air. Saturn is a very windy planet. Winds there are more than four times stronger than the ones we have on Earth. A day over there lasts 10 hours and 14 minutes because Saturn spins on its axis pretty fast. But the planet takes its time while going around the Sun. A year there equals 29 Earth years. Saturn's radius is more than 36,000 miles. It means the gas giant is nine times wider than our planet. If Earth was the size of a nickel, Saturn would be as big as a volleyball. Even though some of our planets in our solar system also have rings, Saturn's are the most spectacular ones. You can even see its rings from Earth. And no, you don't have to be a scientist with insanely expensive equipment. All you need is a small telescope. Saturn's rings are not firm. They are made of pieces of dust, rock, and ice. Some of them are as small as grains of sand, and some as big as a house or even a mountain. These are actually bits of asteroids, comets, and shattered moons that fell apart before reaching Saturn. They could be torn into pieces by the planet's powerful gravitational pull. Saturn has over 50 moons, and recently, scientists have discovered some unusual hydrothermal activity on one of them. Enceladus is Saturn's sixth biggest moon. It has four tiger stripes close to one of its poles. Researchers have found that there is an ocean underneath these stripes. Water and ice erupt from that area. So now, we can't but wonder, maybe there's life out there. In the oceans on Earth, some forms of life gather around similar hydrothermal vents. They feed on the chemicals there, same as plants on the surface do with sunlight. And not only that, some of the oldest microbial life on our planet feed on the same energy as the one produced beneath the ocean surface on Enceladus. It could potentially mean there's life developing there right now. Of course, it takes millions and millions of years for even the simplest organisms to appear. But hopefully, scientists will need less time to find more complex forms of life. There are millions of exoplanets out there in space, and scientists have been searching for those that could be potentially habitable. Exoplanets are planets orbiting a star outside of our solar system. Dwarf stars are similar, less luminous than the Sun. They sometimes live for more than 10 billion years. That's enough time for a living organism to develop and evolve into a more complex form. Life might appear on the planets orbiting such dwarf stars, or, like with Saturn, on one of their moons. And here it is, Gliese 876b that orbits the red dwarf star Gliese 876. This planet is mostly a mystery, but scientists assume this is a gas giant that has no solid surface. They believe its atmosphere doesn't have clouds, but there might be water in its liquid form on the planet's surface. T Gardens B orbits a red dwarf that's around 12 light years away from our solar system. The planet's mass is just a bit higher than that of Earth. Scientists think it may have a rocky surface. The planet needs around five days to complete its orbit. It means that one year on Tea Gardens B is actually shorter than one week on Earth. Somewhere far, far away, there's another potentially habitable planet named Kepler-1638b. Okay, to be more precise, it's 3,000 light years away from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. This planet is four times as heavy as Earth and twice as wide. It needs almost 260 days to complete one orbit around its star. The gravity on this planet is stronger than that on Earth. It wouldn't be an easy feat to jump on its surface. One more Kepler coming along. This time, it's Kepler-62e, a planet that's more than one and a half times the size of Earth. Scientists believe this one has a warm, humid, and hospitable atmosphere with cloudy skies. There are 1,200 light years between Earth and this planet. Kepler-62e needs 122 days to orbit its red dwarf star. Its neighbor, Kepler-62f, is another potentially habitable zone. It's a world around 40% bigger than Earth. Scientists think this planet might be covered in water. The oceans on our planet are full of interesting creatures and organisms of all sizes. So the chances are, this planet also hides some intriguing living beings. Or at least, it has the potential to develop life. When we say habitable, it doesn't mean life definitely exists there. It just means there are conditions for some forms of life to develop. LHS 1140b is a planet located in one of the potentially habitable zones. Unlike its gas companions, it's solid and quite rocky. 
The planet's radius is 60% larger than that of Earth, and its mass is seven times bigger. It's one of the densest planets found out there. Since the planet has a big mass, an atmosphere there must be rather thick. Plus, gravity on its surface is much stronger than here on Earth. That's why you would likely have problems just standing on that planet. Hello and greetings from TRAPPIST-1, an ultra-cool dwarf in the constellation Aquarius. It's around 39 light years away from us. Seven Earth-sized rocky planets are orbiting in the star's habitable zone. All of them can potentially have some water on their surfaces. The temperature on these planets is more or less similar to that on Earth. On the Moon, gravity is only 16% of what we have on our home planet. That's why the astronauts could hardly control their movements when they visited our natural satellite. But when it comes to the gravity on TRAPPIST-1 planets, you would probably feel good and comfortable there. And Kepler once again. This time it's Kepler 452b. It's a rocky planet 60% larger than Earth. Its parent star is similar to our Sun. This planet has actually spent around 6 billion years in the habitable zone, while Earth has been there for a mere 4.5 billion years. This planet needs 385 days to orbit Kepler 452. This star is around 20% brighter than our Sun, but has the same temperature. The whole system is very far from our little oasis. It would take you 28 million years to get there. And now, how about KOI 7711.01? It's another intriguing world 1,700 light years away from us. This planet is only 30% bigger than Earth. It gets almost the same amount of heat as we receive from our Sun. Sometime in the future, People might start colonizing the galaxy. They would be looking for new planets to live on. Then we'd certainly have to make really long trips. And maybe one day, we'd reach Proxima Centauri. It's a nearby star that has a couple of planets we could potentially inhabit, like Proxima Centauri b. It's around 4 light years away from Earth. And it doesn't sound that far at first, but it actually is. It would take about 6,300 years to travel there, if we use the technologies that are available these days. It would mean many, many generations to make a trip like that, and it would take even longer to finally inhabit that new world. People would be born and raised on spaceships. They would live their lives there without ever seeing either Earth or the planet they're heading to. Instead of trees, mountains, and rivers, there would be only the dark nothingness of faraway galaxies spreading in front of them. They would never be able to wander unknown streets, breathe in the fresh air, feel the wind, only place for them to travel to would be another part of the ship. Certainly, such a journey wouldn't be simple, but it would pay off if people managed to build some more beautiful worlds like the one we have here on Earth. Is that even possible? Time will tell. Why do we look the way we look? Most of it's down to dear old planet Earth. It's atmosphere, gravity, that kind of stuff. When you go on a week-long beach getaway, you get a tan. Basic. But what about living on a whole other planet? One astronaut spent a whole year living on the International Space Station. Zero gravity means no healthy pressure on your body, so his bones got weaker. So did his muscles. It also gave him more space between his vertebrae, so he got a bit taller. And that's only a year. The more time you spend at the beach, the darker your tan gets. So, what if we move to... Mars. The first major change you might notice, after a couple hundred years, is your brand new skeleton. Gravity on Mars is much lower than on Earth, so your muscles and bones would probably shrink. Not great for surviving on a new planet. Gravity would make us feel our weight differently. If you weighed 150 pounds on Earth, you'd only feel like you weighed about 50 pounds on Mars. You'd need to eat more to get stronger and bigger to make up for Mars's weak gravity. Sweet! Time to grow some larger and stronger bones, organs, muscles, everything. There'd be one more dramatic change. Your largest organ, your skin. It's the most important barrier that protects you from everything. Germs, wind, UV light, looking totally creepy, you name it, it does it. You might just need a whole new skin. How do you feel about orange? Sorry, people. Green skin is totally sci-fi. Here's the deal. Carotenoids offer quite a nice protection against UV light. 
That's the stuff you find in carrots, sweet potatoes, bell peppers, tomatoes, pumpkins. A Mars farmer's market could make a fortune. The more of these veggies you eat, the more orange your skin's gonna get. If you followed a special diet and wore high-tech gear, chances are, one day, living on Mars might be totally normal. Living on Mercury would be really tough. It's the closest planet to the Sun, and it's definitely hotter than Earth, but weirdly, not hotter than Venus. It's really hot during the day, about 800 degrees, but at night, it drops to negative 290. Days on Mercury are kind of crazy. You know, when you finish the day, but you didn't really get a lot done? Problem solved, move to Mercury. A day on this planet lasts about 58 Earth days. That means you'd have a lot of time to get ready for bed. My guess, though, you'd probably get kind of bored. One excellent solution, somehow, become made of metal, like titanium, nickel, or platinum. Those guys can handle extreme conditions. Life on Venus would be way worse than Mercury or Mars. Pressure might be a tiny issue. You'd probably have one long, never-ending headache. Standing on Venus is like being 3,000 feet underwater. Oh, and that thing we need every moment of the day? Chocolate. I mean, air? There's not a lot of that floating around on Venus. There's carbon dioxide everywhere, and the planet's surface is completely dry. That means it's going to be hot. 870 degrees hot. There are a few species on Earth that can survive the boiling point of water. And maybe if they mutated somehow, they'd survive Venus's crazy heat. 266 degrees is the record so far, set by a species of microbes. So get ready for an epic body transformation. Want to live on Venus? You'd probably have to turn into a tiny microbe just to survive. Luckily, Venus's atmosphere has phosphine, which isn't great for humans, but microbes just love it. But since you're not a microbe, not yet anyway, you'd need to wear special gear to control the pressure and feed you air. It's not looking good. Maybe it'd be easier on Jupiter. Yeah! No. It's got no solid land. This planet's made of hydrogen and helium and is known as a gas giant. Unlike Saturn, you'd probably end up just floating around on it. It's like a giant cloud, and if you ever managed to land, it'd be like walking through a super thick fog. Temperatures fluctuate a lot here. It's freezing on the surface, and the atmosphere can be super hot below the surface. We don't really even know. If you lived on Jupiter, there'd be no spoken languages. The gas planet absorbs radio waves, so even if you could speak, no one would hear you anyway. And there'd be no music, so no dance parties. What's the point? People would have to communicate in sign language. Great, but it's not. The atmosphere on Jupiter is wild. All kinds of winds and gas clouds. You probably wouldn't even be able to see anything. So that's not gonna happen. Still, Jupiter is awesome to look at. It's so big that it can fit all the other planets in our solar system inside it, with room to spare. A trip to Saturn will set you back about a decade, and it'd be a big old waste of time. Saturn's mostly made up of layers of gas. It has no solid surface, so farming, building, or any other normal Earth activities are out of the question. Before landing on Saturn itself, you'd probably want to explore those iconic rings around it. You'd fail, though, because the rings are made of millions of ice sprinkles floating in space. That's pretty hard to walk on. You might have thought that Saturn was going to be a good fit for you. Some layers of this gas giant sphere actually have quite a nice temperature. If you dive into Saturn, you'll get to a layer with liquid molecules and a cool 32 degrees. That's like northern Canada, Alaska, Sweden, except that you can't walk on it. Anyway, it's only one minor layer, and the rest of the planet is insanely cold. So I guess if you still want to live on Saturn, you've got some work to do. No biggie, you just got to turn into a snowball or something. What about Uranus? 
time is kind of weird on Uranus. So if you're out that way looking for a nice vacation spot, definitely choose this planet. A two-week getaway on Earth lasts three years on Uranus. There's even a sea if you're up for a beach vacation. The only problem is that it's made of ammonia, that gross-smelling stuff they use for cleaning. But watch out where you land. If you get it wrong, you might end up spending a whole year without any sun. How would you change if you had to spend a whole year in the freezing dark Uranus winter? We'd need bigger eyes to see in the dark, plus more of that thicker skin to keep the cold out. We might even develop a new hearing system, like dolphins have. Neptune. It's another gas planet, but scientists think there's probably a dense core inside. If you took the plunge to live on Neptune, you'd probably turn into a space reptile or cosmic fish endlessly floating around on the surface. Gravity on Neptune is just a little bit stronger than on Earth. Still, it'd be really hard to stay in one place. The wind there is super strong. You'd have to be much heavier to resist it. Time to eat again. Woohoo! But this planet's really impossible to live on. Scientists don't even want to send another spacecraft there. Welcome to Pluto. Freezing cold, tiny, and super far away. Doesn't sound too exciting. It's even smaller than our moon. It would be so hard to stay on the planet. No more trampoline parks, people. You'd probably have to build yourself a huge machine that would spin you around. Sort of a fake gravity machine. Still, you try spinning around all day. You'd need a brand new nervous system to avoid feeling queasy all the time. But Pluto's not all bad. There's a liquid water ocean beneath the surface and ice mountains. If you got yourself a highly trained crew and a bunch of expensive gear and regular supplies from Earth, nah, too much hassle. Spaghettification. Wonder if you can choose your own sauce? It's actually something you might experience if you ever tried to live in a black hole. It's the process of squeezing objects, like you, into long, thin cosmic strips. So, good news, you'll get much taller. Bad news, you'll be thinner than a single human hair. Okay, quick space riddle. Why is the search for life in the universe like a tree? Because you're always looking for a place to plant it. You know, plant it, plant it. Okay, settle down. Anyway, water is the basis of life in any part of the universe. So potentially inhabited planets must have liquid water on them to support life. An incredible number of circumstances must come together for this. The planet must be in the habitable zone of the star. Then the temperature and atmospheric pressure on the planet's surface will be suitable for simple life forms to begin to evolve. A little closer to the star and the water will evaporate, leaving no chance for oceans and seas to form. This is what happened on Venus. It has a size and mass similar to the Earth, but it's too close to the Sun and no life can exist on its surface. Too far from the star and the planet becomes too cold. Water can only exist in the form of ice on the surface, and there just might be liquid water deep below. Neptune is one example of this. In addition, the planet must be solid and have an atmosphere that protects it from solar radiation and allows living organisms to breathe. In our galaxy alone, there are countless stars. Really, you can't count on them. Near each one of them may be a planet. They're called exoplanets. And some of them may be in the habitable zone and have everything for life to form on them. From a list of 4,500 known exoplanets, scientists have identified 24 that can be super habitable. This is the type of planet that is suitable for the existence and evolution of life even more than the Earth. Such planets must be twice as massive as the Earth and 1.3 times larger. A bigger size means stronger gravity and a denser and warmer atmosphere. This will ensure a greater diversity of all living organisms on the planet. In addition, we should pay attention to the host star around which the superhabitable planets will orbit. And there should be a McDonald's nearby. 
Ideally, it should be smaller than the Sun and have a lifespan of at least 15 to 30 billion years. For comparison, the lifespan of the Sun is under 10 billion years, and it took about 4 billion for complex life forms to appear here. Stars such as the Sun can simply run out of fuel before life can develop on its exoplanet. Scientists suggest focusing on dwarf stars. They're smaller and less luminous than the Sun. But their lifespan can be between 20 and 70 billion years. This will give living organisms enough time to develop and evolve. Climactic conditions on superhabitable planets will also be different. The average temperature should be 8 degrees Fahrenheit higher than on Earth. And there should be more water in the form of clouds, liquid, and humidity. These conditions are the most favorable for biodiversity. So the whole planet would be looking like tropical forests on Earth. All 24 candidates for the title of Better Than Earth hey, are more than 100 light years away from us. And with the advent of the new generation of telescopes, we'll probably be able to find out exactly if there is life there and if the conditions there are suitable for humans. Now, let's take a look at the potentially inhabited exoplanets. Tea Garden B It's an exoplanet that orbits a red dwarf star about 12 light years away from the solar system. Typically, red dwarfs can emit flares that blow away the atmosphere of the planets in its orbit. But this host star is calm and relatively passive. Tea Garden B has almost the same mass as the Earth. It makes a complete circle around its star in about 5 days. Yep, you got it right! A year on Tea Garden B is less than a week on Earth. Hold on to your hats! The furthest potential inhabited planet is Kepler-1638b. It's in the constellation Cygnus, about 3,000 light-years away from us. It belongs to the super-Earth class, it's twice as wide and four times as heavy as our home planet. The gravity on it will feel much stronger. Even a normal jump will be much harder for you than on Earth. Although, if this planet is really inhabited, local life is used to such conditions. LHS 1140b This planet is very rocky and solid. Although its size is only 40% larger than the Earth, it's 7 times as massive. It has a strong gravity of 3.25 g's. For comparison, when you take off on an airplane, you experience an overload of about 1.5 g's. So on this planet, you'd barely be able to stand on your feet. Because of its large mass, this planet has a thicker atmosphere. And because of the greenhouse effect, its temperature can be above 19 degrees Fahrenheit. And it rotates around its star quite quickly. It makes a full circle in just 24 days. And now, let's look at the constellation Aquarius. Here's an ultra-cold dwarf, Trappist-1. A small planet orbits in its habitable zone. It's three times lighter than the Earth. Its temperature is similar to ours, but the gravity is half as weak. But we would still feel comfortable there. Remember the people that went to the moon? There, the gravity is only 16% of the Earth's. That's what makes the astronauts move so funny. Kepler-452b is in a system that resembles the older sister of ours. The host star is only 11% older than our Sun and is almost 2 billion years older. The exoplanet itself is 6.5 billion years old, compared to 4.5 billion of Earth's. But these sisters are very far from each other. If you travel at the speed of the New Horizons spacecraft, it will take about 26 million years to get there. So bring a big lunch! This is the closest exoplanet to us, Proxima Centauri b. It orbits the red dwarf Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star to the Sun. This planet is just 4.2 light-years away from us. Its size and mass are very similar to those of the Earth. It probably has an icy structure, like Neptune. Although Proxima Centauri is the closest star after the Sun, we can't see it with the naked eye because it's too dim. So, all these planets, including the 24 that scientists have recently found, are in the habitable zone of their host stars. And, in theory, we can colonize them and make them suitable for human life in the future. But here we'll have to solve one big problem. 
even the nearest exoplanet is too far away for us today. Our modern rockets can fly at five times the speed of sound. And even at such speeds, it will take us more than 100,000 years to get to Proxima Centauri on one of them. Well, we need to come up with something a bit faster to travel to a new home on one of these exoplanets. And perhaps scientists already have the answer. Warp drive. Ooh. This is a piece of technology that will allow us to manipulate space and time. It creates a kind of a bubble in which the normal laws of motion don't work. So the spacecraft will be able to significantly exceed the speed of light. And this isn't science fiction. Humanity already has such technology, although just in theory yet. It's Alcubier warp drive. And no, I didn't make that up. Since no object that has mass can travel at the speed of light, we need to do one trick. The spacecraft has to move by compressing the space in front of it and expanding it behind it. Thus, not only the ship is moving, but also the space-time inside this warp drive bubble. And the maximum speed can be 10 times that of light. But to warp the space-time, the ship must be incredibly large. And to power it, we'll need the amount of energy close to what the whole planet of Jupiter generates. Still, recent calculations of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab show that the ring around the ship, which should create the so-called warp field, shouldn't be perfectly round, as it was thought before. It can be more donut-shaped. Ah, donuts. This will greatly simplify the design and construction and will make it possible to test this technology on a spacecraft the size of a Voyager 1 probe. Even though it still seems impossible, scientists are already saying that there is hope. And while we don't know what technology will be used, in 2069, NASA plans to launch its first interstellar mission to explore potentially habitable planets outside of our solar system. Various rumors say that the speed of light can be achieved with laser technology. If the probe is very small, it can be launched to the Alpha Centauri star at almost the speed of light. There are also two other alternatives to power spaceships. These are nuclear energy and energy from matter and antimatter collisions. Ooh, these technologies are still a mystery to humanity, though. Well, for the time being, stay tuned. This planet's called the jewel of the solar system. Made up mostly of gases, it could float on water should you find a reservoir 75,000 miles across and just as deep. But what makes the planet so recognizable is its beautiful rings, gray, tan, and beige. They consist of dust, rocks, and ice. Some bits are as tiny as grains of sand, others as large as skyscrapers. The planet I'm talking about is Saturn, and right now, Earth is hurtling toward it at breakneck speed. It all started on a regular day over half a year ago. All of a sudden, Earth changed the course it had been following for several billion years. But instead of rushing toward the Sun, it started to move away from the star. On second thoughts, it might be for the better. We've got more time to find a solution. Earth used to move around the Sun at a speed of 67,000 miles per hour. For some mysterious reason, when it left its orbit, the speed remained the same. It means we're going to cover 746 million miles separating our planet from Saturn within a year and three months. At first, no one realized what had happened. But a couple of hours later, it became obvious. Despite the panic that engulfed Earth's inhabitants, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. But all too soon, it started to get colder and colder. Astronomers' forecasts were pessimistic. People started to leave their homes at the poles, move closer to the equator. Most plant and animal species were having a hard time. Some of them went extinct, even though we were trying to save them in greenhouses and special conservation parks. The sky changed dramatically. In a week, we could see Mars clearly. It looked like a big reddish sphere hanging low over our heads. Jupiter became as bright as the moon. Once Earth was as far away from the Sun as Mars, days became twice dimmer than they used to be. At first, our planet's atmosphere was acting as a barrier between people and space. That's why we didn't feel the cold immediately. 
But seven days later, everyone who dared to leave their home had to be cocooned in heavy winter clothing. By that time, the temperatures had already dropped down to minus 145 degrees Fahrenheit. It got even colder once our planet passed Mars and hurried through the asteroid belt. It's been one of the most dangerous regions on our way so far. Yes, people could admire awesome meteorite showers streaking the sky. But several space bodies managed to get through the Earth's atmosphere. They slammed into the ground, flattening mountains and leaving behind gigantic craters. They caused tsunamis and triggered earthquakes. Right now, most of the planet, including the oceans, has already turned into an icy desert. There's a lack of food and natural resources. We've built underground towns and tunnels connecting them. Our scientists work day and night to find a way out of this situation. If they don't, that's what's going to happen. The closer our planet will be to Saturn, the more the ring planet will loom over the horizon and the larger it'll look. Soon, it'll already shine brighter than the full moon. The massive yellowish-brown orb will be visible even during the day, but it'll look especially impressive at night. Instead of sleeping, millions of people will spend hours watching Saturn grow larger and larger. One day, the distance between the two planets will become the same as the distance between Earth and Mars used to be. Saturn's disk will be about a quarter the size of the full moon. Its rings will be as large as two-thirds of our natural satellite. Soon after that, our planet's speed will start to increase under the influence of Saturn's gravitational pull. The ringed planet is nine times wider than Earth, and its mass is almost 100 times greater. That's why, instead of moving at a speed of 29 miles per second, we'll be dashing through space at almost 40 miles per second. That's 2,400 times the average car speed. Saturn's gravity will influence the Moon more than that of Earth. In no time, we'll lose our satellite. It'll get catapulted into outer space, likely to go into an elliptical orbit around the Sun. If Earth wasn't about to crash into Saturn in the nearest future, the Moon could one day cross paths with our planet again. No good would come out of such an encounter. But what's happening on Saturn's side of things? Saturn is one of the largest planets in the solar system, second only to Jupiter. Even though the rings surrounding the planet are huge, they're rather thin, less than a mile thick. Still, the main rings are large enough to stretch from Earth to the Moon. But how did the planet get these breathtaking accessories? Beyond the outer edge of the main rings, A, B, and C, there's something astronomers call the F-ring. Several million years old, it's the weirdest one. This constantly shifting ring is made up of icy material and is incredibly complex. Its curves, twists, and clumps of brighter substance make it look as if it's braided. Saturn has more than 50 confirmed moons. Two of them, Pandora and Prometheus, flank the F-ring on either side. They weave outside and inside the ring, acting like shepherds. They herd ice particles into a 60-mile-thick band. But why are they performing this elaborate dance? No one knows. What scientists do know is that when Saturn's rings were evolving, icy material clumped together and formed moonlets. Some of them grew and turned into the planet's largest moons. But two of them collided. That's how the mysterious ring F appeared. If the moonlets had only been made up of small icy particles, the space collision would have left a ring and nothing else but they had dense rocky cores. Those remained intact and turned into Pandora and Prometheus. People don't have any evidence Saturn's ever collided with another space body. Our Earth might be the first. But before crashing into the planet itself, we'll have to get through its rings, including the Ring F. And no, our planet won't just punch a hole in them. Saturn's rings are made of small particles. Earth's gravity will start to pull some of them out of their orbit once we're close enough. It'll result in a long plume that will reach our planet. And later, when we squeeze through, the cloud of icy particles will drag after Earth. It won't have enough power to rid Saturn of its rings completely, though. They'll continue to move around their home planet. But their orbits will change and become more elongated. There will be no more stunning bands. Over time, the rings could probably settle down again, but Earth won't give them such a chance. The collision with our planet won't leave Saturn unscathed. If there's still a possibility to sneak a peek at the sky, 
people will be able to see the rings disappear into nothingness, but not for long. Soon, the largest chunks of rock will start hitting the surface of our planet, leaving behind lifeless land dotted with craters. In the worst-case scenario, Earth might even collide with one of Saturn's numerous moons. But let's imagine we've passed through this region in one piece, and now our planet's very close to Saturn. The gas giant might seem airy, but there's no way Earth can fly through the huge sphere and leave from the other side. Gravity is what keeps all that gas together. The very gravity that make our planet speed up. The closer it is to the much bigger space body, the stronger the pull is. It'll cause the fault lines on Earth to rupture. It'll also set off powerful volcanic eruptions all over the world. And then, with enormous force, our planet will crash into Saturn. The planet's atmospheres will get compressed. This will cause a dramatic and fast temperature rise, and in no time, the air will be on fire. Scientists claim that Saturn's core is dense, made up of iron and nickel, and surrounded by a rocky layer. But we'll never make it there. Earth will burn in the bigger planet's atmosphere after being literally torn apart. Our beautiful, blue-green world will turn into billions of trillions of tons of vaporized rock. Pity. Maybe Earth will become yet another Saturn's ring, instead of the ones it's ruined. Sounds grim, I know. Yeah, we can't save Earth from Saturn, but that's only a bad dream. So maybe we take that effort and save us from a real threat, climate change. Eh, just saying. TRES-2b is a planet where night never ends. And it's not your regular night with stars shining in the beautiful skies. Here it's pitch dark and scorching hot. TRES-2b is a gas giant, roughly one and a half times more massive than Jupiter, and its surface absorbs light better than charcoal. It might also have a faint dark red glow because of its burning air, which is as hot as fresh lava. Lovely. In the star system of 55 Cancri, there are five planets, four of which are gas giants similar to Jupiter and Saturn. But the fifth one, or rather the first, because it's closest to the star, is different in a most horrible way. 55 Cancri E is so close to its sun that half the planet's surface is a literal ocean of molten lava. The other half is in eternal darkness because it never sees the sun. The planet is always turned to its star on one side. And between the scorching and the dark, there's the twilight zone, a thin strip of gloomy nothingness. HD 189377b – well, I'm not going to say that again – is the only exoplanet in the orbit of its star. And at first glance, it looks quite pretty, blue and white swirls making up wondrous patterns on the surface. But these pleasant colors actually come from hard silicate particles in the planet's atmosphere, which means it rains glass here. But the worst is that winds reach the speed of 5,400 miles per hour, or almost Mach 7. Well. For comparison, the fastest wind speed on Earth was 254 miles per hour, over 20 times less. Thus, the glass falling from the sky travels horizontally at hypersonic speeds, shredding everything in its path. The next system, whose name I won't even try to pronounce, um, this one, has three exoplanets, which are all being slowly destroyed by their own star. It happens because that star is not a regular. It's a pulsar, a rapidly spinning core of an exploded star. It creates powerful electromagnetic pulses in several directions while rotating at several thousand times per second. As a result, the planets orbiting this deceased star are slowly being eaten away and will eventually disappear entirely. Kepler 70 is a hot blue dwarf star that exploded into a red giant some 18 million years ago. At the time, it was orbited by at least two planets, the closer of which was a Jupiter-like gas giant. Its name was Kepler-70b, and it still exists. But the overgrown star consumed it and transformed it into a blazing hot rocky world. Right now, it's one of the hottest planets ever discovered. Its temperature is higher than the surface of our sun. It was lucky to survive spending time inside the star, but it's evaporating now and will probably be no more in the near future. WASP-12b 
is one of the weirdest and saddest planets out there. The enormous gravity of its star, combined with the planets consisting mostly of gas, result in the star slowly devouring its protege. WASP-12b has already taken the form of an egg, stretched toward its merciless sun, and it's unable to do anything with its condition. In another 10 million years, the planet will inevitably succumb to the voracious star's appetite. If you ever wondered what it's like to walk on ice and hot coals at the same time, Gliese 436b is a planet that would give you a vivid example. Being extremely close to its sun, the Neptune-sized exoplanet boasts temperatures hotter than a blazing oven. And yet, it's covered in ice, which burns incessantly. This ice is much denser due to the enormous gravity of the planet, staying solid even under extreme conditions and not melting away. No list of frightening worlds could do without mentioning Venus, the Earth's evil twin. The second planet from the Sun has an atmosphere so thick and full of clouds that its surface is much hotter than that of Mercury. Volcanic eruptions constantly thrash Venus. Its gravity is almost a hundred times stronger than ours, and those clouds I mentioned are not made of water but of sulfuric acid, which condenses and rains down on the ground, adding to the inferno. But even if you were brave, or crazy, enough to try to pass through these clouds, you probably couldn't. The winds up there are as strong as some of the most powerful hurricanes back on Earth. Here we have a very long name for a very, very cold planet. Although the host star is not too far away, it's a small and rather cool red dwarf, whose light and heat barely even reach the planet. The temperatures out there fall as low as minus 370 degrees, which is only marginally warmer than absolute zero. The exoplanet is thus dark, gloomy, and covered in eternal ice that never thaws. Still, if it has a rocky core, it might generate some heat. So there's a chance that deep below the frozen surface, some unknown alien things might lurk. Dimidium, located roughly 50 light years away from our solar system, is a planet hostile to any living thing on many accounts. It's tidally locked to its sun, which means one of its sides is always facing the star, while the other is always turned away. The hot side is heated to over 1800 degrees, perpetually blown over with winds reaching 600 miles per hour. Despite Dimidium being a gas giant, it has a large amount of iron in it, which melts and evaporates in the atmosphere, creating clouds. And when those cool down, they fall on the surface in the infernal rain of molten iron. Oxygen is usually viewed as an element that might bring life to a planet, but this is definitely not the case for Osiris. Scientists were shocked to find oxygen on this planet, or rather around it, because it's eight times closer to its star than Mercury is to the Sun. This extreme distance makes Osiris a living melting pot, where anything that could burn will. It's also responsible for a very short orbit of the planet around the star. A year on Osiris is just three and a half days on Earth. To boot, the atmosphere of the planet is constantly blown and melted away by the heat from its sun. Karat Exo 3b is neither as hot nor as cold as some of the others on this list, but it's terrifying in its own more insidious way. It's a gas giant similar in size to Jupiter, yet 20 times denser. This makes this exoplanet's gravity weigh down on everything on its surface 50 times more than it would on Earth. Stepping on it would be your ultimate doom, because you'd be immediately crushed by the density of its atmosphere. Karat 7b is another oven-like world. Its day-to-day -day temperature is over 4,000 degrees. Combined with the rocky surface, it presents an infernal landscape. The rocks on the ground bubble and boil, evaporating in the atmosphere, where they cool down and eventually fall back on the surface in a brimstone rain. The saddest thing about Karat 7b is that it might have once been a gas giant whose atmosphere melted away from the heat, leaving only the scorched core. We're used to thinking that asteroids are the only free-floating rocks in space, but things like OTS-44 make you think twice and shiver. Imagine a planet about 11 times more massive than Jupiter roaming in space without being bound to the orbit of any star. Given its gargantuan size and mass, 
If OTS-44 collides with any other planet, it would utterly destroy it and go on floating as if nothing happened. Scarier still, scientists are sure there are millions of such rogue planets out there, just waiting to be discovered. There's no hard proof of their existence yet, but theoretically, carbon planets have formed somewhere closer to the center of our galaxy. Any oxygen getting in their atmosphere will get into a reaction with carbon and transform into CO2, forming black, toxic clouds. On the ground, there would be oceans made of tar, spewing up geysers of methane and crude oil. There would be rains, too, but they'd be far from refreshing. Torrents of pure gasoline and hot liquid asphalt would blast the ground and probably burst into flames on impact. Hard to imagine anything that would survive such conditions. Two pictures are rapidly changing in front of your eyes. Our huge planet and a black void. The picture of Earth is getting smaller by the second. You're flying away from the spaceship into an endless vacuum and don't know what to do next. The International Space Station flies 250 miles above Earth's surface. A spacewalk is routine for astronauts who work there. Astronauts have spent more than 11,000 hours in the black abyss to this day. Fortunately, during all this time, no one has ever flown away into outer space without coming back, as we've seen in the movies. But unfortunately, astronauts face other, no less terrible, dangers during spacewalks. One such accident happened in 1966. Eugene Cernan put on a jetpack and went into outer space to carry out some repair work. The jetpack, which helps an astronaut control flight in zero gravity, heated up a lot. Eugene put on special protective pants made of metal to protect himself from this heat. The pants protection didn't work when he went into outer space. Instead of directing the heat away from his body, the pants began to heat up. The suit was heavy and uncomfortable, like a knight's armor. It rubbed his skin and restricted movement. Working in zero gravity is physically very hard, but Eugene also had to deal with his whole suit heating up that day. Inside the spacesuit, he felt like he was in a hot bath. High temperatures and hard work caused overexertion, dehydration, and severe weight loss. His face was sweating, and drops of sweat blinded him. During this spacewalk, the astronaut lost about 13 pounds of weight. Other astronauts came to the rescue and took him back to his spacecraft. To reduce overheating, they sprayed him with cold water from a hose. In a sense, to go out into an infinitely huge open space, an astronaut must put on a suit resembling a body cage. Another dangerous incident happened in 1973. Two astronauts, Pete Conrad and Joe Kerwin, went into outer space to repair a solar wing on the Skylab space station. The wing didn't turn around, and the astronauts tried moving it manually. Using force, they turned the stuck wing, but it pushed them. The push was so strong that it threw both astronauts aside. They didn't have time to grab onto a nearby surface and began to fly away into outer space. Fortunately, they had safety cables that didn't let the astronauts go away for good. By grasping them, the astronauts returned to safety. In an ordinary modern spacesuit, there are more than 10 protective layers. Such a suit protects against extreme cold and hot temperatures. It's tear resistant and doesn't leak moisture from the outside. This protection is necessary to prevent depressurization. If a small passage appears between your body and space, then all the oxygen will start coming out of the spacesuit. The more oxygen the suit loses, the more vacuum it gets. This leads to terrible consequences, such as suffocation and increased body volume. It looks as if you start to inflate from the inside. In 2007, Rick Mastraccio went into outer space to do some repair work. For some reason, there was a hole in his left glove next to his thumb. It was on the outer layer of the glove. But the worst thing was that the astronaut hadn't noticed it. He continued to work as if nothing had happened. But one damaged layer could destroy the second. The second one could tear the third one, and so on, 
until the vacuum reached the astronaut's skin. Rick was supposed to work six hours in outer space, but during the fourth hour, he noticed the damage in his spacesuit. The astronaut reported this to command and received an urgent order to return to the ship. He never found out how the hole had appeared. Inside the ISS, there are many chemicals necessary for working in space. For example, ammonia has the property of freezing almost any surface. This chemical frost is used to cool some components of the station during overheating. The leakage of this substance on the ISS is practically impossible. This is exactly what astronaut Robert Kerbeam heard from experts during the training before his first flight to space. But this accident occurred to him on his first spacewalk in 2001. Robert was working outside the space station when an ammonia leak started. The liquid splattered all over his spacesuit. A thick layer of ice quickly covered the glass. Robert didn't see anything. He feared that he had broken something, but the accident was not his fault. The protective layers of the spacesuit didn't allow Robert to freeze, but the ammonia severely restricted his movements. The main problem was that he couldn't return to the ship. Ammonia could get into the station, and this could lead to an emergency. Robert had to stand in outer space for one and a half hours and wait for the leak to end. After that, he successfully returned to the station. To realize how difficult work is in outer space, we need to understand what a spacesuit is. It weighs 280 pounds, which is as much as a scooter. You won't feel its weight in zero gravity, but it will still make you sweat. Astronaut Chris Hadfield had described it by saying that every movement inside your spacesuit meets resistance. The suit scratches your skin, squeezes your bones and joints, and forces you to spend twice as much energy on simple movements. In such conditions, you start sweating and your eyes get wet. This moisture flies inside the helmet and blinds you until it evaporates. But if there's too much moisture, it can threaten the life of an astronaut. Such a case happened in 2013 with astronaut Luca Parmitano. He went into space to measure something outside the station. At one point, he felt that the back of his head was wet. He informed the others about it and got an order to return to the station. When Luca was coming back, he had to turn upside down. As soon as he did this, water gushed into his helmet. It covered most of his face. Luca couldn't see or hear. He tried to report the trouble to base, but the water covered his mouth. Fortunately, his partners rescued him and helped him return to the station. When they opened the helmet, almost half a gallon of water poured out. Astronauts' cables are some of the most reliable defenses against floating away into space. But what if one broke from a strong push, or because the astronaut didn't fix it well? For additional protection, there's a backpack called SAFER, Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. It's like a jetpack. It releases gas from small tubes and changes the direction of your flight. If you're spinning in space, SAFER stops and aligns your movements. You can take manual control and fly using a special joystick. SAFER was first used in 1994, but before engineers created it, there was the MMU the Manned Maneuvering Unit. In 1984, astronaut Bruce McCandless used it for the first time. You may have seen this famous photo where he floats in outer space without a cable. The problem was that Bruce was the first tester of such a jetpack. He wasn't 100% sure if it would work. He went into outer space and unhooked the cable from himself. There was nothing else to keep him from flying into the infinite black abyss and his team wouldn't be able to save him. Imagine how scary it must have been. Fortunately, the jetpack worked. However, after three missions, NASA decided to stop using the MMU as it was unsafe. After that, engineers invented SAFER. Jetpacks and cables are reliable safety systems, but the best protection for an astronaut in space is their skills. Each astronaut has six years of higher education and several more years of training. They spend many hours training in virtual reality with spacewalk simulations. 
They train their body, endurance, and mind, since the main thing in a dangerous situation in space is not to panic and stay calm. Buckle up, fellow space enthusiasts, because we're about to uncover the celestial secrets that have been unveiled this year. From giant stars to organic molecules, this year is going great for astronomers. So let's catch up on all the excitement you might have missed in 2023. First of all, we've discovered some real astral monsters. Imagine looking up at the night sky and seeing stars that are not just big, but absolutely enormous. Scientists have been using a special telescope called the James Webb Space Telescope to explore the early days of the universe. And during their adventure, scientists stumbled upon ancient stars that are 10,000 times bigger than our sun. Yes, you heard it right, 10,000 times. These giants of the stellar world were some of the very first stars ever to form in the universe billions of years ago. Imagine a globular cluster as a massive cosmic crew, where each group consists of a whopping 100,000 to 1 million members. These clusters are like giant family gatherings, with all the stars being born around the same time. But what makes these newly discovered monsters so special? Well, their cores, or their central parts, are way hotter than what we see in stars today. Scientists think that this intense heat might be due to a lot of hydrogen burning at really high temperatures. It's like they're having a galactic barbecue party. Something fascinating happens in these globular clusters. The smaller stars crash into the supermassive ones and gain extra energy, like a power-up. But here's the twist. Most of these clusters are now getting old, and the supermassive stars disappeared a long time ago. We can only see hints of their existence in the clusters we observe today. Scientists study them by just the mysterious traces of their grand presence. The discovery of these monster stars is incredibly important for our understanding of the universe. If scientists can gather more evidence to confirm their existence, it would be a major breakthrough. It would help us learn more about globular clusters and how supermassive stars form in general. But that was only the first fascinating discovery of 2023. Although the next one is kind of sad. You know those beautiful rings that make Saturn look so fancy? Well, guess what? They might disappear in the not-so-distant future, astronomically speaking. NASA's Cassini mission, which explored Saturn from 2004 to 2017, gathered some fascinating data about the rings. During Cassini's grand finale, when it did some cool maneuvers between Saturn, scientists noticed something surprising. The rings were losing a lot of mass every second. Tons of it. That means this magnificent halo will only stick around for a few hundred million more years, at most. That may seem like a long time for humans, but in the grand scheme of the universe, it's just a blink of an eye. The important thing is that we've learned that huge rings like Saturn's don't last forever. They eventually fade away. Oh, well, at least you and I personally won't catch this moment. Scientists have a fun theory about what will happen when Saturn's rings disappear. They think that the other ice and gas giants in our solar system, like Uranus and Jupiter, might have once had massive rings too. But over time, those rings wore down and became more like the thin, wispy bands of asteroids like what Uranus has now. Saturn's rings are mostly made of ice, but they also have a sprinkling of rocky dust. This dust comes from asteroids and teeny tiny meteoroids crashing into the celestial objects and breaking apart. It's like a snowstorm of icy particles and space debris. The research also revealed that Saturn's rings appeared long after the planet itself formed. They were still forming when dinosaurs roamed the Earth. So, in terms of astronomical age, they're actually quite young, only a few hundred million years old. This discovery has got scientists all excited because it means something dramatic happened in Saturn's past to create this stunning icy disk. But this is a mystery waiting to be solved. Scientists want to figure out what exactly caused the rings to form and why they have such a breathtaking structure. 
Let's hope they'll figure it out. But moving on to something more optimistic, we have another exciting space news. Recently, scientists have been studying one of the most distant galaxies in the universe, and they found something amazing. Organic molecules. The galaxy in question has a long name SPT-04-1847. It's over 12 billion light years away from our little blue planet. Can you even imagine that distance? It's the farthest galaxy ever known, where complex organic molecules have been found. That's why looking at this galaxy is like looking at something from when the universe was just a baby. We have no idea what this galaxy looks like now. The light that has reached us is what it looked like when the universe was only 1.5 billion years old. Imagine being able to see things from so far in the past. So what they found is something with a very complicated name. A polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecule, or simply PAH molecule. You might be wondering, what in the world is that? Well, guess what? You can actually find these molecules right here on our planet. They can be in things like the smoke from car engines or even forest fires. PAH molecules are made up of chains of carbon atoms. And here's the super cool part. They're considered the basic building blocks for life. Imagine that, life's building blocks, those tiny carbon chains being discovered in a galaxy that's so far away. That's like finding a needle in a haystack. They also found out that gas floating around in that galaxy is filled with heavy elements. That's a big deal because it suggests that many stars have come and gone there, creating all these amazing elements. This means that this galaxy can be potentially rich in many other elements too. This discovery opens up a world of possibilities and raises so many exciting questions. How did these molecules form in a galaxy so distant? And since we're looking into the past, what could have happened to these organic molecules during this time? Could they have evolved into life? We're only scratching the surface of the incredible things waiting to be uncovered. By the way, if it's so far, how did scientists even manage to discover something like that? Well, they had the instrument called the James Webb Space Telescope. This fancy telescope was recently launched and has superpowers when it comes to observing the universe. So when the scientists were studying this faraway galaxy, they had a little problem. The light coming from those distant objects was so faint that it was hard to see or detect. But guess what? They had a brilliant idea to solve this. They used something called gravitational lensing, which is like a special power of nature's magnifying glass. Imagine two galaxies lining up perfectly, just like in a photo shoot. The light from the faraway galaxy, the background one, travels towards us. But on its journey, it passes through the foreground galaxy, which is like a giant space lens. And guess what? The foreground galaxy's gravity bends the light, just like a magnifying glass, making it bigger and brighter. It's like having a cosmic zoom lens for our telescopes. This bending of light creates a super cool shape called an Einstein ring. It's like a halo or a ring of light surrounding the foreground galaxy, basically a nature's way of showing off its magical powers. With gravitational lensing and these beautiful Einstein rings, scientists can see distant objects more clearly and learn amazing things about the universe. And thanks to all that, they managed to uncover the hidden chemical interactions from the early galaxies. Isn't that incredible? The scientists are beyond excited about this discovery. They never expected to find such complex organic molecules in a galaxy that's incredibly distant. Who knows, maybe this is just the beginning of a thrilling cosmic journey. So, keep your eyes on the stars, fellow space explorers. The universe is full of surprises, and who knows what other mind-blowing discoveries await us out there. Let's hope we'll learn even more in the future. Hey Mythbusters, today we're debunking some classic space myths. Hop on the next space shuttle and let's get to the bottom of these tales once and for all.
Picture this, you're floating weightlessly in space, sipping on a cup of delicious hot chocolate, when a peculiar thought pops into your head. Can you scream in outer space? And if yes, would anyone hear that scream? If you've watched the movie Alien, then you know the answer to this one. You can't hear sounds in outer space. It's not that sounds don't exist. It's just that you can't hear them. There's no one better to clarify this myth than Chris Hadfield. He's been on a couple of spacewalks during his life as an astronaut. And once you're out there in the darkness of space, you can't hear anything. All you hear is silence. Complete silence. But hey, just around the corner is a massive ball of explosion, aka the sun. We just can't hear the explosions happening because there's no medium for sound to travel through. It would be quite uncomfortable for an astronaut, though, if they could hear all the noises going on in outer space. Now, imagine you're zipping through space, feeling like a futuristic superhero, when a shooting star passes by your side. But wait, is it really a star? Unfortunately, shooting stars are not stars at all. They are small space rocks known as meteoroids, entering Earth's atmosphere and creating a stunning light show. Oh, and since we're debunking myths, let's head straight for another one. You've probably heard that meteors only crash into Earth on extremely rare occasions, like once every dinosaur extinguishing apocalypse. That's not true. Scientists estimate that about 48 tons of meteoritic material fall on Earth each day. But almost all of this material is vaporized in Earth's atmosphere. The bright trail we see in the night sky is what we popularly call a shooting star. Next time you make a wish upon a shooting star, remember, you're actually hoping on a tiny piece of space debris. It's not so romantic after all. Can we or can we not fly into the stratosphere on air balloons? Apparently, we can. The Earth's stratosphere starts relatively close to the ground, about 7 or 8 miles up from the Earth's surface but it continues a long way up. If you were to fly yourself all the way into the stratosphere with some type of air balloon, just make sure you have really good equipment at hand. You'll need a special suit and some breathing devices because air starts to get pretty thin the higher you get. Of course, if you do go all the way up, you need to get a picture of the Earth's curvature. So take a chest harness with you where you can put a special camera or something like that. And how about you live stream the whole thing? That would be a first. Imagine it's been 102 days since you left Earth. You've adapted well to life in outer space, but something weird is happening to your body. You're getting taller. How is that even possible? Don't stress about it. It's completely normal. The truth of the matter is you're not getting taller. This is what happens to your body when it's not under the effect of gravity. Our body has natural space between vertebrae and joints. On Earth, this space is almost completely squeezed due to the force of gravity. But in space, your body gets some time off of the pushing force of gravity and begins to stretch more and more. So yes, astronauts can grow up to 3% taller when they're on long missions. And here's a curiosity, NASA has that all covered when they're tailor-making spacesuits, of course. This way, astronauts will always have extra space in their suits. Once astronauts are back on Earth, the anti-gravity effect will wear off. So maybe they'll spend a few days wearing capri pants before it fits perfectly on their bodies again. Never have I ever pictured an airplane door bursting open mid-flight and a bunch of passengers being sucked into the atmosphere like flying feathers. Well, I'm betting most of you have had similar thoughts when getting inside a plane. Now imagine if this were to happen in outer space. Common knowledge says that if an astronaut is sucked out of an airlock, this person would be burnt to a crisp. Brace yourselves, because this is not only true, but the reality of it is way worse. According to astronaut Chris Hadfield, this is what would happen. The part of your body in the shade of the sun would experience temperatures of negative 418 degrees Fahrenheit while the part of you getting sunlight would burn at around 480 degrees Fahrenheit. Your lungs would collapse and your blood would start to boil like tea water. So you would burn, freeze, lose your ability to breathe and boil. Yikes! 
How many times have you heard that astronauts have to work out every second of every day, otherwise they'll pass out? This is a complete myth. Remember we talked about gravity earlier? Due to the lack of gravity in outer space, our bodies don't have to do any heavy work. Our torsos don't have to sustain the weight of our heads. And we don't have to make any effort to move our legs because, essentially, there's no walking in outer space. Now, imagine living like that for six months or even a year of your life. Your muscles could turn into jello. That's why astronauts work out. They'll strap themselves and run on a treadmill, or they'll do some weightlifting in a special machine. This way, their muscles won't feel the lack of gravity too much. They do need to keep hydrated, though. You know what? If I was an astronaut, I'd ask NASA if I could take my super soft water flask up into space with me. You've probably heard that space smells like burnt steak or barbecue sauce. Now, as much as this sounds absurd, this myth is more true than it is false. Astronauts obviously can't smell space when they're in it because they can't take off their helmets. They usually smell it once a space vehicle docks and they open up a hatch. Apparently, what causes this smell is the presence of hydrocarbons that float around in space. Who would have thought, huh? Hey, smart people, let me ask you a question. Do you really think that if astronauts fly at the speed of light, they won't age a single second? I knew you'd say no. Let's get a few things straight. First of all, we haven't figured out how to operate vehicles at the speed of light. This would require an immense amount of energy, and we don't have the technology to do that. Second, even if we managed to send a human inside a spacecraft that traveled at the speed of light, this person would still age. They would age differently than the people who remained on Earth, that's a fact, but they would still age. Do you lot really think there's such a thing as immortality? Nah. If you've seen the first Avatar, then you certainly remember that humans only managed to get to Pandora because they traveled in cryosleep. In other words, they froze their bodies, put them in a cryo bed, and traveled for years without aging. Yes, this sounds amazing, but we still don't have the technology to do that. Our bodies are mainly made out of water, right? And when you freeze water, it expands. That's why you should never leave soda cans unattended in your freezer. Right now, if we froze a person's body, the water inside of it would expand, harming tissues and organs. So no, we can't cryosleep our way into interstellar travel. Not yet, at least. Here's a crazy thought. What would happen if an astronaut took a drone with him on one of their spacewalks? Unless it's a NASA-designed drone, maybe the thing would freeze and burn like humans would if they went into space without a suit. But hey, a person can dream, can't they? No one will hear your cry in space, or something like that. We've all heard this famous chilling phrase, and it's actually true. Space, for the most part, consists of a giant nothingness. There's a lot of, you know, space in space. But this doesn't mean there are no sounds in space. In fact, there are plenty of them, and some of them can even make you shiver. Let's take a look at the scariest space sounds. First of all, how are cosmic sounds even recorded? Sound is just the vibration of molecules. When you scream, you make the molecules push each other furiously until they reach the ear of the person you're yelling at. Then these vibrations get transmitted to the brain, and we recognize them as something that you might need to apologize for. In other words, to hear something, we need molecules. And that's where things get complicated. There aren't any of them in space. The entire universe almost completely consists of a vacuum. No, not a hoover absolute nothingness. However, the wizards from NASA still record space sound somehow. So how do they do it? The thing is, there are some types of waves that don't care about molecules. We regular folk can't perceive them without some special devices. These waves include, for example, radio waves. We'll need a radio or something like that to recognize them. And that's exactly what NASA's satellites do. They catch random radio waves. Thanks to their heroism, we can find out how different cosmic bodies sound. These satellites record a variety of waves, fluctuations of plasmas, magnetic fields, and other, you know, stuff. And then scientists from NASA transform all this into normal soundtracks. And some of them sound quite frightening, to put it mildly. 
Let's take our magnetic field, for example. It surrounds our planet like an invisible shield, protecting us from all sorts of nasties, like radiation and solar winds. At the same time, we can neither see it, feel it, nor hear. Oops. Well, the last one is outdated. Scientists from the Technical University of Denmark took magnetic waves recorded by the ESA swarm satellite. They converted them into an audio track and got a pretty creepy result. Now, to be honest, it sounds more like an eerie entity stalking you in the middle of the night. And if you remember the maps of Earth's magnetic field, it starts to feel like a spider crawling nearby. Ew. And this isn't the first strange sound that we caught on Earth. Recently, we caught another weird radio emission from space. Scientists found out that the repeating signal came from somewhere very far away, like billions of light years away from us. Such fast radio bursts usually lasted no longer than a few milliseconds, but this one was unique. It lasted about three seconds, basically thousands of times longer than usual. And at the same time, the signal was very precise, so much so that scientists even compared it to a heartbeat. Scientists believe that this signal is caused by pulsars, or neutron stars. One time, Nikola Tesla caught something similar. But unfortunately, at that time, we didn't know about such things as pulsars. So Tesla was sure that he had caught a message from some extraterrestrial life. It's a pity that the truth turned out to be much more boring. But let's move on from the Earth to the Moon. In 1969, the astronauts of the Apollo 10 mission the spacecraft that made the final test flight to the moon flew past its surface. And then they caught some strange signals coming from the dark side of the moon, the side that we never see because the moon is tidally locked to us. The sound was so weird that the astronauts weren't even sure whether to report it to NASA. They were afraid they wouldn't be taken seriously, and maybe even not allowed to participate in the next space missions. Here's what it sounded like. But according to NASA, it's not some creepy extraterrestrial music at all. These may just be some radio waves that affected each other because of their proximity. Although the astronauts who heard it for the first time probably felt a little creeped out. Let's move to the other planets. Now, 40 years ago, scientists actively explored the surface of Venus. They sent as many as 10 probes there, which were supposed to capture audio and video shooting from the surface. Now we know what Venus, which could easily destroy us at any attempt to even get close to it, sounds like. Horrifying. And you wouldn't expect anything else from the most dangerous planet in the solar system. Unfortunately, Venus is even more toxic than the average Twitter user. <laughs> so these probes didn't last too long. They heroically arrived on a planet and soon broke down. Next one is Jupiter. This space giant, which is 11 times larger than the Earth, never fails to scare us. One of NASA's probes, Juno, flies around Jupiter every few weeks. The probe is moving at a tremendous speed, 130,000 miles per hour. One day, Juno caught one of the strongest invisible signals it had ever encountered. This was the point at which the mad solar wind came into conflict with the magnetic field of Jupiter. It kind of sounded like a cosmic boom. The original sound lasted two hours, but it was compressed to a few seconds. It actually sounds more like a collision of a sea wave and a rock. But here, in terms of horror, Jupiter surprisingly loses to one of its small moons, Ganymede. In 2021, the Galileo space probe flew past Ganymede, and during its flight, it received a rather strange recording. These sounds are satellite radiation, and it's unclear whether it sounds like a cozy sunny day in the jungle or like thousands of bats waiting for you in the night. Next one is Saturn. This signal was caught by the Cassini-Huygens Automatic Interplanetary Station, which was launched into space in 1997. When flying past Saturn, Cassini recorded a pretty scary sound. This terrifying cry of thousands of souls is actually just some radio waves. They aren't too different from what the auroras emit on Earth. A little later, Cassini received another recording. The sounds made by lightning and thunderstorms on Saturn. They sound pretty interesting, too. More like popping corn or a Geiger counter, right? 
But that's just because these lightning strikes have a crazy frequency. Moving on from the solar system to outer space. The famous Voyager 1 was launched back in 1977 and continues to send us data even 40 years after its launch. In 2012, it left the solar system and entered interstellar space. And then, while abandoning its home, Voyager 1 detected the sound of plasma waves. The original recording lasted seven months. But fortunately, scientists felt sorry for us and reduced it to 12 seconds. It isn't really eerie, but is still kind of unsettling. And although it feels like nothing can beat Saturn's horrors, let's end this tournament with one of the scariest objects in the universe, a black hole. This sound was recorded by the Chandra Space Telescope. While studying a cluster of galaxies in the constellation Perseus, they discovered something strange. Some undulating movements appear from the center of the cluster. They spread out in all directions, like circles on the water. Scientists have suggested that this was caused by a supermassive black hole. The thing is, black holes don't always devour space objects entirely. Sometimes they kind of spit them out. This causes vibrations of gases, which we can convert into soundtracks. What's interesting is that the oscillation of each such wave actually lasts about 10 million years. You're just listening to a very accelerated recording. Scientists have reduced the delay between oscillations by about 144 quadrillion times. So let's check it out. This is probably the eeriest sound from the whole list. Nothing too loud or wild, but there's something dark and disturbing about it. Now, those were the scariest space sounds captured by NASA. To be fair, most of them sounded creepy simply because they're radio waves. But it's still fun to get spooked sometimes. Now, did you know that there's an astronomical object in which space and time actually swap places? How does that work? And what exactly does swapping space and time mean? Well, let's figure it out. Imagine that you're on a spacecraft. The vehicle can only move straight. Your path leads to some inevitable point, and you have no idea what lies ahead. You can only hope that it won't be too bad. Meanwhile, everything around you is complete madness. A chaotic collage of many historical events. What do you see? Ancient humans and dinosaurs? The birth of the universe? A uh, future? Who knows? That's what the universe would look like if we swapped time and space. And theoretically, this is what you would see if you fell into a black hole and somehow were able to survive. But how is something like this even possible? First of all, let's discuss time and space. Imagine drawing a light bulb on a sheet of paper. Then grab one more sheet and draw how it lit up. Right now, it's just a small circle of light. Another sheet? The circle of light is growing. It gets bigger and bigger in size, until finally, it turns into a giant circle. In real life, the bulb lights up in the blink of an eye. That's because the speed of light is the fastest in the universe. But here, on our drawings, we capture the propagation of light frame by frame. We see how, over time, the light has grown from a small dot to a large circle. But if you connect these circles, doesn't it remind you of some shape? For example, a cone? Yes, exactly! This is called a light cone, and time is the central axis of this cone. Why? Because light turns from a small dot into a large circle over time. To remember it, let's draw a time vector, an arrow inside the cone. It goes from the past to the future. Meanwhile, the circles are space. In space, we can move however we want, in any direction. We can move up or down, in zigzags, and so on. But no matter what zigzags we draw, along the timeline, we're always moving forward. We can't turn back in time, and we can't stop it. This helps us define time and space. Time is the direction in which the light cone is oriented. This is the direction where all our paths lead, and where our future inevitably lies. And space is the whole variety of directions perpendicular to the timeline. This is a straightforward graph. If it could be applied to the entire universe, then time would flow the same everywhere. However, if you've watched at least some popular sci-fi movies, you know that this isn't the case. In reality, time can be crazy. For example, if you're chilling near a black hole, what will be two hours for you 
may turn out to be 20 years for your friend on Earth. But why? Well, take a deep breath. Now, gravity comes into play. Oh, I know about gravity. It's that thing that helps me to stand on the ground, you may think. But it's much, much more complicated than that. Gravity is one of the basic physical forces in our world, and it's incredibly powerful. In fact, she's such a girl boss that she can distort space and time. She can literally influence the speed of time like an almighty wizard. How? Well, let's take something slightly bigger than a light bulb. For example, a supernova. (laughs) Somewhere in the universe, a star has just made a boom. How do we know about it? Well, nothing in the universe, no sound, no radio waves, nothing, travels faster than light. So we'll know about the birth of a supernova only when we see it. And this will happen only when its light cone grows enough and reaches our planet. So the light cone grows and grows. So far, everything is fine. And finally, it reaches our planet. But there's a catch. You see, our planet is very massive, very massive, and it has pretty strong gravity. What happens then? Gravity changes the direction of the light cone. It begins to attract the cone to the center of our planet. And with it, it also attracts our arrow of time. That means it slows the time down. And the closer the light cone is to us, the more the arrow bends and the slower time goes. What does it mean? Well, for example, the fact that the watch on your ankle will lag behind the watch on your wrist, that your head is aging faster than your legs, and that astronauts in Earth's orbit age a little slower than people on Earth. This is what scientists call general relativity. Right. But how does this relate to our topic? How can we understand what will happen if we swap space and time? Nah, don't worry, we're almost there. Now, imagine a cosmic body with incredibly strong gravity. It bends time and space so much that it feels like they swap. This is a black hole. A black hole attracts absolutely everything to its center. No stars, planets, no light can escape from there. Let's say our light cone is approaching it. First, as usual, time begins to bend toward the center of the black hole, attracted by its gravity. But the gravity is very strong, so it bends more and more, and time goes slower and slower the closer you're to the center. In the end, the light cone crosses the boundary of the black hole, the so-called event horizon. At this point, it gets so distorted that now it's literally pointing downwards. We can say that time has changed its direction time is pointing downwards. What kind of nonsense is that, you may ask? It'll be easier to explain in a real example. Imagine you're a crazy astronaut who decided to jump into a black hole. And there's an observer in the spaceship who watches you doing this for some reason. At first, for you, nothing changes. You look at your watch, you see that five minutes have passed, and everything's okay. But for the observer, first of all, you'll fall for a very long time. The observer has been sitting there for 50 years, and you're still falling. All because your time has slowed down. Secondly, since space is also distorted near the black hole, the observer will see how you'll begin to stretch like spaghetti. This is a scientific term, by the way. It's called spaghettification. And then you finally cross the event horizon. The observer doesn't see you anymore. Light cannot escape from a black hole, so your image won't reach the observer even if you're still inside. And what about you? What if you somehow survived? Remember, the time arrow is pointing to the center of the black hole. What does it mean? It means that now, the center of the black hole is your future. It isn't a place, it's a fate that you can't change. And wherever you came from, as well as the rest of the universe, no longer exists for you. Because now, it's not a place, but an event from the past. And since you can't turn back time, you'll never be able to come back. But what is around you? Complete chaos. The rays of light now move in all directions, forward, backward, and so on. The rays depicting the events of the past, the future, the present, all this is moving around you. In reality, space and time didn't swap places, but it feels like they did. Because in space, you can now only move forward, as if along a straight line. And time, reflected in the light rays, surrounds you everywhere and moves in all possible directions. And here we go back to the beginning. 
This horrifying example helps us imagine what it would feel like if time and space got reversed. Of course, all this is just theories and guesses. The very idea that we're moving in some one direction, the one we haven't chosen, and there's complete time chaos around, sounds quite frightening. And yet, it would be a very interesting experience. Sounds dangerous. Mm, Why don't you go first? Our sun is an average-sized star, and still, it could fit 1,300,000 Earths. The star is also 333,000 times as heavy as our planet. NASA has translated radio waves created by planets' atmospheres into audible sounds. That's how astronomers found out that Neptune sounds like ocean waves. Jupiter, like being underwater. And Saturn's voice resembles background music to a horror movie. Here on Earth, it's bebop jazz. Now I made that up. The sun's surface is scorching hot, but a bolt of lightning is five times hotter. Earth gets struck by 100 lightning bolts every second, which results in 8 million lightning strikes a day and around 3 billion a year. Ooh, shocking! If you manage to go to the moon one day and see fresh footprints, that doesn't mean there's someone else there with you. Footprints or similar marks can last for a million years over there because the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. There are no winds, not even a breeze, that can slowly erase those footprints. Astronomers have found the largest hole we've ever seen in the universe. It's the giant void that spreads a billion light years across. They found it accidentally. One of the research team members was a little bored and wanted to check how things are going in the direction of the cold spot. That's an anomaly in the Cosmic Microwave Background Map, or CMB for short. It's a faint glow of light that falls on our planet from different directions and fills the universe. It's been streaming through space for almost 14 billion years as the afterglow that occurred after the Big Bang. So you fall right into the heart of the black hole and prepare for a sad end. Well, you don't have to. Falling into a black hole won't necessarily destroy you or your spaceship. You have to choose a bigger black hole to survive. If you fall into a small black hole, its event horizon is too narrow, and the gravity increases every inch down. So if you extend your arm forward, the gravity on your fingers is much stronger than on your elbow. This will make your hand lengthen, and you'll feel some discomfort. Rather significant, to be honest. Things change if you fall into a supermassive black hole, like the ones in the center of galaxies. They can be millions of times heavier than the Sun. Their event horizon is wide, and the gravity doesn't change as quickly. So, the force you'll feel at your heels and at the top of your head will be about the same. And you can go all the way to the heart of the black hole. This myth is busted. If you watch a very touching movie in space and start crying, your tears won't run down. They will gather around the eyeballs. Your eyes will get too dry, so you'll feel like they're burning. Any exposed liquid on your body will vaporize, including the surfaces of your tongue. Speaking of burning, that's one thing fire can't do in space. Fire can spread when there's a flow of oxygen. And since there's not any in space, well... Once they explode, stars aren't supposed to come back to life. But some of the stars somehow has survived the great supernova explosion. Such zombie stars are pretty rare. Scientists found a really big one called LP40365. It's a partially burnt white dwarf. A white dwarf is a star that burned up all of the hydrogen, and that hydrogen was previously its nuclear fuel. In this case, the final explosion was maybe weaker than it usually is, not powerful enough to destroy the entire star. It's like a star wanted to explode but didn't make it, which is why part of the matter still survived. If you ever go into space, don't take off your spacesuit unless you're on a spaceship. Air in your lungs would expand, as well as the oxygen in the rest of your body. You'd be like a balloon, twice your regular size. Good news? The skin is elastic enough to hold you together, which means you wouldn't explode. (laughs) Small comfort. When something goes into a black hole, it changes shape and gets stretched out just like spaghetti. 
This happens because gravitational force is trying to stretch an object in one direction, but at the same time, squeeze it into another, like a pasta paradox. Speaking of, a black hole that's as big as a single atom has the mass of a really big mountain. There's one at the center of the Milky Way, called Sagittarius A. It has a mass like for a billion suns, but luckily, it's far away from us. If you made a big boom on an asteroid, you'd never be able to hear its loud sound. Yes, we often hear the sound of spaceships and battles in space in the movies, but that's just a myth. Sound is a wave that spreads because of the vibrations of molecules. A person claps a few feet away from you, the sound wave begins to push the first air molecule next to the clap, then the second, third, and so on, until the wave reaches your ear. So, to spread sound, we need molecules like air or water. In our atmosphere, sound waves spread out just fine. But space is a vacuum, so it's nothing here. You can clap your hands loudly there, but there just won't be any molecules that can vibrate and carry that sound. So, to carry on a conversation, you'd either need a radio or really good lip-reading skills. Meteoroids orbit the sun, while the majority of human-made debris orbits our planet. For example, we launched almost 9,000 spacecraft around the world from satellites to rocket ships. Even the tiniest pieces can damage a spacecraft at such high speeds. Galaxies, planets, comets, asteroids, stars, space bodies are things we can actually see in space. But they make up less than 5% of the total universe. Dark matter, one of the biggest mysteries in space, is the name we use for all the mass in the universe that's still invisible to us. And there's a lot of it. It may even make 25% of the universe. Dark energy makes the other 70% of the universe. Hmm, that adds up to 100, right? Now, let's look at the moon. It always looks at us with one side. This means the moon has a dark side, and the sun's rays never get there. Well, that's a myth. The whole point is that the moon is gravitationally locked to the Earth. There are days and nights there, too. It's just that this rotation is perfectly aligned with the rotation of the Earth. So whenever you look at the moon, you only see one side. Although there are days when the sun shines there too, so it's not the dark side, it's the far side. And we even have pictures of this place. And there's one of the biggest craters in our entire solar system, the South Pole Aiken Basin. It's as wide as two states of Texas. Yeehaw! One myth that turned out to be untrue is that people have never actually been on the moon. This is the original spacesuit of the first astronauts who were there. Look at the sole of the shoe. Some people claim there's no way they could have left footprints like this there. Actually, they could. On the moon, the astronauts wore extra boots over their suits, and their soles matched the footprints on the moon perfectly. Now, the astronauts didn't need them when they left the moon and tossed them when the moonwalk was over. They left a lot of stuff there, too. They even tossed the armrests of the seats in the lunar module to reduce the weight. Now, counting all the Apollo lunar missions, the total weight of rubbish on the moon is approximately 187 tons, including several lunar rovers, spacecraft debris, six lunar modules, and all the experiments left behind. That's like three Boeing 737s. Another myth about the sun is that it's yellow. Let's send you into space for this one. You look out the window and... It's white! The sun only appears yellow to us through the filter of our atmosphere. The composition of the air and its thickness just distorts the light of the star. But stars do come in different colors. Cooler stars have bright orange and red colors. These are usually very old stars, older than our sun. But young and very hot stars are bright blue. The sun is about in the middle of this spectrum. Oh, one more myth about asteroids. We need to fly a little farther than Mars's orbit. Whoa, we're in an asteroid belt, and we constantly have to dodge giant rocks and blocks of ice. We got in some dense asteroid clouds. Hmm, not true. The fact is that space is huge, and the distances are incredible. All the rocks and debris in the asteroid belt are only 4% of the weight of the moon. So there really aren't that many of them there. To understand the dimension of the emptiness in space, 
Look at the collision of two galaxies. There are billions of stars in each of them. If we mix them up, it's unlikely there will be any collisions even here. Imagine a basketball spinning on someone's finger. A point near the middle of the ball takes longer to spin back to where it started than the spot where your finger is. Earth spins in much the same way. People in the center of Africa are turning at 1,000 miles per hour as the planet rotates, while anyone at the South Pole doesn't really move at all, other than rotating in place. At the same time, we're all moving forward through space equally fast, since the planet is also hurtling around the sun at 67,000 miles per hour. The temperature at the boundary of our planet's inner and outer core is 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's as hot as the surface of the sun. And the pressure there is 3.3 million times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it's no larger than an average car, it's still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it's only the second one to orbit our planet. Called 2020 CD3, it's our temporary mini-moon. It won't be with Earth for long, though. The asteroid is following a random orbit and is slowly drifting away. Temporarily captured objects, such as 2020 CD3, are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. The movement of galaxies and clusters billions of light years away from us suggests there's some enormously massive body outside the visible universe. After billions of years, the expansion of the universe will make the space so sparse that we won't be able to see the stars in the sky at all. The moon isn't a perfect sphere. It's shaped like an egg. Plus, the satellite's center of mass is a bit more than a mile off its geometric center. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow. But not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. <laughs> not a great vacation spot. Saturn is mostly composed of hydrogen and helium, with some traces of methane, ammonia, and water. But it contains more sulfur than Jupiter, which gives the planet a smog-like orange hue. On Earth, sound waves make air molecules vibrate which is why we're able to hear sound. Other planets and moons allow sound to travel through mediums like their atmospheres and oceans, too. In space, though, it's said that there is no sound, since there aren't any molecules to vibrate and deliver sound waves. However, not all researchers agree on this, given that space isn't just a desolate vacuum. In between the emptiness, there are clouds of gas and other stray particles. So, depending on where you are, sound waves can be possible. Astronomers know for sure that the universe is growing bigger, and the speed at which it's ballooning is increasing all the time. But if the whole thing is swelling into something bigger, then it must have some kind of an edge, right? It's unlikely that people will ever find out, but if so, then what would it be? A ginormous brick wall and then nothing? An abyss that leads to nowhere? The most common theory is that the universe is shaped in such a way that it can't have an edge, but it's not the only idea. Another theory is even more difficult to comprehend. The universe is, indeed, infinite. And our part of it isn't that unique. It means that somewhere out there, there's another you, or rather, other you. One of them is just a bit shorter. Another wears their hair in a different way. And the third one is identical to you in all possible ways. There's also a theory about a multi-universe that consists of many smaller universes. And the universe we live in is just a tiny bubble among other similar bubbles. Those scientists who support this idea are also sure that bubble universes can come into contact with one another. Then gravity starts to flow between them. And when two or three universes connect, a big bang occurs, just like the one that created our home universe. Neptune is the windiest place in the solar system. Clouds of frozen methane are whipped across the planet at a speed of 1,200 miles per hour. Neptune's core is solid and consists mostly of iron and some other metals. Its mass is 1.2 times bigger than that of Earth. The temperature inside reaches 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
Astronomers also believe that at a depth of 4,500 miles, there might be a diamond layer where it's raining diamond crystals. On Earth, people are used to a beautiful sunset that's painted in hues of orange, red, and yellow. On Mars, however, the normally pinkish red sky turns blue as the sun goes down under the horizon. It's because Mars is much farther away from the sun than Earth, making the sunlight less intense. The fine dust in the Martian atmosphere absorbs the blue light and gets rid of the warmer colors that you typically see on Earth. Whether it's blue or yellow, both sunsets look spectacular. At around a quarter of the size of Earth, the Moon is pretty enormous relative to other satellites out in space. There's nothing quite like this situation anywhere else in the solar system. Pluto has a moon that's almost half as big as itself, but it's more like a twin than a satellite. There are more than 150 moons in our solar system, and Earth's is the fifth largest out of the whole lot. There might be a labyrinth of lava tubes on the moon. Not long ago, astronomers received the results of an underground lunar topography. They discovered a massive cave under the satellite's surface. About 30 miles long and 60 miles wide, the cave's likely to be the result of 3 billion-year-old volcanic activity. After streams of lava hardened, they created a thick, hard crust on the outside. But inside, lava kept flowing, melting the rock, and forming tunnels and caves. Countless pits in the moon's surface discovered by NASA might be the openings to lava tubes. We can't dig up most of Earth's gold. 99% of it ended up in the center of the planet several billion years ago attracted by the iron in Earth's core. We're talking about 1.6 quadrillion tons of gold here. That's enough to coat the entire planet's surface in 1.5 feet of the stuff. And if all those meteorites hadn't later smashed into the ground, bringing extra amounts of gold, it would be even rarer. Not so long ago, astronomers discovered a massive blob of some mysterious substance. It was hidden underneath the surface of the moon's far side. Its mass was the same as that of a pile of metal five times larger than the big island of Hawaii. The enigmatic something lies almost 200 miles beneath an enormous crater that appeared on the lunar surface billions of years ago. The blob likely has something to do with a super collision. It might be the metal core of the object that hit the moon back then. Scientists can't wait to lay their hands on the discovery. It could explain lots of things about the South Pole Aitken Crater, the largest known in the solar system. If it was on Earth, its oval-shaped basin would stretch from Washington, D.C. to Texas. In 2011, astronomers discovered an enormous water reservoir simply floating in space around a supermassive black hole called a quasar. Floating water vapors have been found throughout the universe, but they aren't that common. This particular reservoir holds around 140 trillion times the amount of water in the Earth's oceans. It's one of the oldest, largest, and, at more than 12 billion light years away, one of the farthest things known to humankind. Astronauts in space can lose about 1% of their muscle mass each month. To prevent this, they have to stick to an exercise regimen that lasts two hours every single day. The Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy are going to meet in 3.75 billion years. They're moving toward each other at a breakneck speed. When the two galaxies collide, they'll form a huge elliptical galaxy. I won't be around then. Have you ever looked up at the night sky and tried to count all the stars? Yeah, good luck. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, has about 100 billion stars. But other estimates put it at over 200 billion, since calculating the exact amount is an almost impossible task, even for astronomers. As for the entire universe, there are at least a billion trillion stars. That's one with 21 zeros after it. For comparison, that means there are more stars in space than there are grains of sand on all of the Earth's beaches. All aboard! This is the Intergalactic Cruiser. The destination on your ticket is a tour of the local group of galaxies. Featuring the large and small Magellanic galaxies, the Orion Nebula, the Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies, and a few surprises in between. Tickets, please. 
Be advised you may experience a slight tingling sensation as we rev into hyperspace. The ship and everything in it is going through a dimensional phase change. It's nothing to worry about. The tingling passes quickly. Now, passengers, as we head toward galactic latitude 180 degrees north, as Terrarians are accustomed to calling it, our first main item of interest will be an intense star-forming region known as M42, the Orion Nebula. But first, a special treat by the captain that's not on the advertised itinerary. The Horsehead Nebula! It's off to the port side, that's left for you Aggies. Its designation is M43. The newborn star at the top of the horse's head has a strong solar wind that is deforming the shape of the nebular cloud. Get a good look at it now, because in a few thousand years, those gases will be completely blown away by the star-like nebula that made our sun. Yep, long gone, except for the nebular gases captured by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Okay now, one of our junior explorers asks a question. What is the M in M42 and M43? Well, young lady, the M stands for Messier. Pronounce Messier, not Messier, as in, is your room messier than mine? <laughs> Charles Messier, I mean Messier to be precise, was a French astronomer in the 18th century. He published a catalog of 110 fuzzy objects as seen through an early telescope. The Horsehead Nebula is number 43 on his list. We'll see more M's as we continue our tour. Heads up! We're coming to the Orion Nebula. The gases in the nebula may seem less colorful than you expect. That's because we're accustomed to seeing long-exposure telescopic photos and enhanced photos designed to highlight the different gases in the nebula. May I suggest using the pair of tinted glasses that come with your onboarding packet if you want to heighten your experience. In we go! Now, it's a good thing we are in hyperspace. As we approach the trapezium star cluster in the center, the bright star, Theta C, sends out a solar wind at 5 million miles an hour. It sculpts the whole cloud of gas and dust, creating shock waves that compress nearby stars. Theta C is a megastar, 200,000 times brighter than the sun. It will go supernova in about a million years. I won't be around then. Oxygen, hydrogen, and sulfur glow in ionized states like a fluorescent light bulb. Oxygen blue, hydrogen red, some green and sulfur, and dust glow as yellow-orange. As we pull out of the Orion Nebula and rise high above the galactic plane, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are visible. Our sun, which you cannot distinguish from this height above the galaxy, is in the Orion Spur that lies between the outer Perseus arm and the inner Sagittarius arm. Notice the center of the Milky Way contains a bright magnetic bar that plays an essential part in star formation. Over 70% of nearby galaxies include magnetic bars. It's a sign of a mature galaxy. Only 20% of distant galaxies contain magnetic bars in their cores. Which reminds me, passengers, the juice bar is now open. Our H1 server will take your orders. Now, that's the Andromeda galaxy far, far out to the port side. But may I call your attention to the many dwarf galaxies, over 40 of them, that populate our galactic neighborhood. We're heading to one now. The Large Magellanic Cloud, LMC to astronomers, is an irregular dwarf satellite galaxy of the Milky Way, containing about 30 billion stars with a dynamic star-forming region called the Tarantula Nebula, which we will be cruising through shortly. Of course, if there is a large Magellanic Cloud, there must be a small Magellanic Cloud, SMC. And there it is, below and to the left of the LMC. The Milky Way will eventually ingest both dwarf galaxies. Some prefer the word accreted, but the result is the same. If you use your tinted glasses again, you can see that the LMC has stripped away a tremendous amount of gas from the SMC, as they have interacted gravitationally over millions of years. Hey, I know all about gas! Now we're heading out of the Milky Way to a distance of about 50 kiloparsecs. That's 50,000 parsecs, or about 163,000 light years. So, what's a parsec? No, it's not slang for pair of socks. 
A parsec is about 3.26 light years. A light year is about 5.88 trillion miles. The word parsec is a combination of two words, parallax and second. Parallax is the shift an object seems to make when viewed from two different perspectives. Looking at an object with your left eye and then your right eye, you'll see the object appear to shift. That's parallax. When an astronomical object is photographed with the Earth on one side of the Sun and then again six months later on the other side of the Sun, the shift is measurable in degrees of arc, or minutes of arc, or seconds of arc, down to milliseconds of arc. That's a parsec, a parallax of one arc second, which turns out to be 3.26 light years. Hey, what about a Joan of arc? That's how you measure distances in France. <laughs> Meanwhile, since you can't measure a light year with a ruler or a tape measure, parsecs are the scientific way of telling the distance to a star or intergalactic object. The greater the parallax, the closer the object is. The smaller the parallax, the farther away it is. Now, straight ahead in the heart of the Tarantula Nebula is the R136 star cluster. Within a distance of one light year, there are over 40 stars each with a mass over 50 times that of the Sun. Wow! Comparatively, there isn't a single other star within four light years of our home star, Sol. And that's a good thing. You can see Supernova 1987A at about 2 o'clock high. A blue giant star, 100,000 times brighter than the Sun, experienced a core implosion resulting in a Type II supernova 100 million times brighter than the Sun. It has left behind a neutron star, clouded in dust and gas, and a wildly spectacular display of fireworks. Now, 1987A in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the closest supernova to Earth since 1604, which happened in the Milky Way about 20,000 light years from Earth. It was visible in the daytime for about two weeks, or so. After 1987A went supernova because it was a blue giant star, speculation has increased that the blue giant star Rigel, the foot star of the constellation Orion, might go supernova in the not too distant future, or already has gone supernova. Rigel is approximately 860 light years from Earth, so anything that happens to Rigel would take about 860 years before it would be noticed on Earth. Supernova 1987A ejected the heavy elements, like cobalt, nickel, and iron, and lighter silicates into the Tarantula Nebula, where they will form the basic building blocks of stars and planets. Our server is now offering space-themed snacks. May I recommend the Jupiter Cotton Candy Puffs for the children on board? Aww. Remember, I know all about gas. Our next stop is the Andromeda Galaxy and Environs. Notice its halo as we leave the Milky Way and its 300 billion stars behind. As many as 150 globular clusters reside in the galactic halo. They orbit down and through the galactic disk and contain some of the oldest stars in the universe. How they got here in our home galaxy is a matter of intense study. You will notice NGC 6822, an irregular dwarf galaxy off to the starboard. NGC stands for New General Catalog of Astronomical Objects. Now you'd think there'd have been an old general catalog, but there wasn't. It was just a new catalog. There is, however, a revised new general catalog which astronomers refer to regularly. Clears that up, huh? As we pass NGC 6822, you'll notice a magnetic bar beginning to form and bright patches of new star formation. This galaxy was discovered in 1884 by E.E. E. Barnard, and is also called Barnard's Galaxy. Mr. Barnard was quite an astronomical observer. He has a crater on the moon named for him, one on Mars, an area on Jupiter's moon Ganymede, a minor planet, number 819 Bernardania, and the star with the fastest movement across the sky, Bernard Star. Now, not too many people have their name emblazoned across space as has Edward Emerson Bernard. 
Approaching the giant Andromeda galaxy with its trillion stars, we will skirt above its western edge and visit one of the enormous galaxy's dwarf companion galaxies, M110 or NGC 205. Yes, it also has two designations. Hey, take your pick. The first of its kind, a dwarf spheroidal galaxy of about 3.5 billion solar masses, M110 or NGC 205 if you wish, has eight globular clusters near its core. It too will be swallowed, or accreted if you prefer, by the Andromeda galaxy. It may have already been stripped of much of its stars and gas, a point highlighted by M110's general lack of star formation. Everybody having fun yet? And now, our final stop, M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, the third and last spiral galaxy of our local group. Located in the small constellation of Triangulum, Latin for triangle, good guess, M33 is about half the size of the Milky Way. The Triangulum Galaxy is 2.7 million light-years from Earth, but it is much closer to the Andromeda Galaxy and moving towards it. If two spiral galaxies collide, it may alter the course of the Andromeda galaxy and prevent the predicted collision with the Milky Way. Well, let's hope so. Now, this important message. We will serve dinner on our return trip to Earth. There's a choice of chicken or fish. We hope you have enjoyed the tour. Hey, if you fill out our survey and give us five stars, you can also have dessert. What can survive in space? Well, people can, if they have an excellent spacesuit. Spacesuits are, shall we say, kind of a needed item in the vacuum of space. Without one, you'll have to stay inside the spaceship or modular dwelling on the Moon or Mars. Currently, NASA has only several older spacesuits ready for use outside the spacecraft, like the International Space Station. NASA's Artemis mission to the Moon is planning to have new suits designed for both men and women. It has a quarter-billion-dollar budget for them. These new suits are much less bulky than the older ones and much more fashionable. But what other creatures besides people can live in space? Three named animals were sent into space, and they all came home safely. Does that qualify? Two dogs, Belka and Strelka, spent a day inside a Russian spacecraft in 1960 and became media stars upon their return. The USA launched a chimp named Ham on a 16-minute ride into space. Space starts 62 miles above the ocean level and only takes a rocket a few minutes to get there. Ham, who wore a spacesuit, performed all his button-pushing tasks admirably and is honored in the International Space Hall of Fame in Alamogordo, New Mexico. But tardigrades can actually live in space. Tardigrades, or water bears as they are often called, are brown and look like teeny tiny grizzly bears and are one of the most miniature animals with legs. They have eight of them. Most species of tardigrades have no eyes, but some do. It's possible to see water bears with a good magnifying glass, since they average about a half millimeter in size. Sprinkle a little water on moss and they'll come out. They can walk about one body length per second and run at about two body lengths per second. Water bear eggs are easier to spot because they're bright white. The European Space Agency took water bears to the International Space Station and left them outside for 10 days. They survived. They still survived with no air, water, almost a perfect vacuum, harmful solar radiation, extreme cold, and heat. Well, that doesn't sound very fun, does it? In extreme conditions, water bears rely on their exoskeleton, or tun, to protect themselves. In laboratory tests, this exoskeleton could withstand immense pressure at over 87,000 pounds per square inch. That's quite a spacesuit they got. Water bears have even been frozen solid for 30 years. And when warmed up, the water bears revived and were still able to reproduce. As we search for life in space, as we explore Mars, these types of extreme life forms become essential to understand. If water bears can survive literally every environmental condition, can we conclude that life is everywhere in space? Extremophiles are life forms living in extreme conditions, such as other planets might have. Movile Cave in the country of Romania is one such place that could just well be on another planet. All life on Earth, on the surface of the Earth, is carbon-based. 
it means that carbon atoms act much like a universal Lego block, to which hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen atoms connect to form the molecules that the cells of living organisms are made of. But not in Movile Cave. Movile Cave was sealed off at least 2.5 million years ago. The water that percolates up through limestone rock has formed a lake in the cave, a mix of hydrogen sulfide, poisonous and corrosive, and ammonia. What could live in this toxic soup? Well, sulfur-based life forms. An entire ecological system without light or photosynthesis exists inside Movile Cave. The food chain is built on chemosynthesis, microorganisms eating sulfur-based chemicals. 33 species of sulfur-based creatures were found living in the hostile environment of Movile Cave. Shrimp, scorpions, centipedes, snails, etc., etc. Movile Cave is an alien world deep underground full of sulfur-based life forms. If creatures like this exist in Movile Cave on Earth, what can we expect to find living in outer space? Bacteria. Bacteria can live in outer space. And fungi, too. Bacteria form the base of the food chain, and bacteria have been proven to be able to live in outer space. In the 1980s, cosmonauts on the Mir space station complained that something was growing outside the station's windows and blocking their view of Earth. It turned out, upon inspection, to be bacteria and fungus, or fungi. The windows, made of quartz, were being damaged and weakened by what was growing on the surface. Fungi were also found to be eating copper on some of the cables. Mold was found growing in some places on the outside of Mir. The space station was under attack by microorganisms. Scientists took this very seriously and began to investigate. It seems that in a sterile environment such as space, bacteria come out of their hiding places when no other microorganisms are around. Cosmic radiation may even help them mutate and adapt to the space environment. The bacteria seem to be growing even faster in space than on Earth. Years later, the United States decided to run a bacterial experiment on the International Space Station. They coated rocks with various bacteria and put them outside the space station. Some bacteria did not survive the harsh conditions of space, but many did. One strain called OU-20 survived for over a year and a half outside the ISS. Japan also did a bacterial experiment on the International Space Station. Outside the Japanese Kibo module, Kibo's robotic arm placed three panels with the bacteria Dinococcus radiodurans, or D radiodurans for short. It survived outside in space for three years. The lead scientists of the Japanese experiment calculated that the bacteria could live as long as eight years in space. That's long enough to make a journey to Mars and back four times. Now, this raises a couple of interesting questions. Could life have come to Earth from Mars in a space rock? And, more pointedly, could an infectious bacteria come to Earth in a space rock? Suddenly, what had only been considered in science fiction books and movies was now a subject of intense scientific scrutiny. And then came the Mars meteor. Antarctica is the best place to find meteors because it's covered by ice. The ice in the Allen Hills regions of Antarctica is locked in place by the configuration of the surrounding mountain. The ice here sublimes. That means the ice evaporates, never becoming liquid, but turning directly into vapor. As the ice in the Allen Hills region sublimes, it exposes all the meteors that have hit the ice over many hundreds or thousands of years. Meteor hunters literally drive around on snowmobiles and pick them up with tongs, never touching them to avoid contaminating them with human bacteria. They bag the meteors, number them, and record the location and any other pertinent facts about the meteor. That's how meteor ALH84001 was found, the Mars meteor. Since Earth gets hit by about 17 meteors every day, over thousands of years the numbers add up. Almost everywhere has been hit by a meteor at one time or another. 11 years apart, two houses on the same street in Weathersfield, Connecticut, had their roofs punctured by one-pound meteors. But only a rare few meteors ever come from Mars. 126 meteors have now been identified as coming from the Red Planet. ALH 84001 came from Mars. Scientists know this because the United States has landed on Mars and sampled Martian rocks and the Martian atmosphere composition. 
ALH 84001 contain the same gases as Mars' atmosphere and similar chemical composition as the rocks. But the meteor also contains something else – a fossilized life form. There has been much debate about whether or not the tiny object inside ALH 84001 is a fossilized bacteria life form, or rather a chemical deposit. But the studies aboard the International Space Station confirm that bacteria can live for a long duration in space. So it is entirely possible that some bacteria could make the journey to Earth from Mars in a meteor. The United States Mars Exploring Perseverance rover has recently found organic molecules inside Mars rocks. These organics are carbon and hydrogen. It won't be known if these organic molecules were produced by living organisms or merely by chemical reactions until the samples are returned to Earth sometime before 2030. The search for life on Mars is ongoing. But Mars is not the only place in the solar system that might have life. Jupiter's moon Europa is a good suspect, too. Entirely covered by miles of thick water ice, Europa may have an ocean of salty water beneath its icy crust. Ice acts as an insulation blanket. Combined with possible internal thermal processes in Europa's core means that Europa's ocean water could be warm. The Europa Clipper Express mission plans to confirm conditions for life on Europa. Loaded with nine pieces of observational equipment, the Europa Clipper will attempt to observe just about everything possibly going on by orbiting above Europa including the chemical composition of the mysterious reddish-colored material that has ejected onto the surface ice from the ocean below. What could this reddish material be? Could it be a specific chemical mix? Or could it be krill, shrimp, fish, life forms like in Movell Cave? Or the ancient remnants of a bright side narrator? Hmm, stay tuned. There's a giant ghostly hand that stretches across space. Its eerie fingers are reaching for a glowing red cloud that looks like molten space lava. Although it looks like a scene straight out of a sci-fi movie, it's 100% real. The hand was formed after an enormous star collapsed in a huge supernova explosion. The boom created a new star that is bursting with energy. The energy given off by the star is so big that it caused debris from the explosion to swirl around it. This is what created the supernatural-looking hand. The hand is so big that it stretches a colossal 150 light years. As for the lava like structure it's reaching for, that's actually a huge gas cloud. So, while it looks spooky, it's completely harmless. And you can go to sleep tonight without worrying about a giant ghostly space hand scooping you out of bed. There's a bizarre star hidden in the depths of space that seems to randomly flash on and off. It's known as Tabby's star and its light dims at super irregular intervals for really odd lengths of time. There have been so many theories about what's causing this, from meteor showers to outer space interference. The comet shower idea was quickly debunked. Dust from comets, which would block the light, goes away after a couple of months. Tabby's star fades slowly over decades, so the timing just doesn't add up. It can't be down to planets either, as no planet is big enough to block that much light from a star. After years of speculation, scientists have finally found an explanation for the strange phenomenon. The dimming and brightening are actually a result of space dust. A ring of dust surrounds the star, which often temporarily blocks its light. On day 8 of its mission in 2019, China's lunar rover discovered something really strange on the far side of our moon that caught the attention of the entire world. While navigating a path around a bunch of lunar craters, it spotted something really weird lurking inside one of the moon's holes. It was a colored substance, just like gel, that we'd never encountered before. The curious material was a rich dark green color and glistened like diamonds. After a year of analyzing the foreign substance that measured 20 inches by 6 inches, the scientists finally came to a conclusion. The glistening effect seems to come from glass. In space, it usually appears as a result of lunar impact melts. This means that it's most likely from a comet or rock that has hit the moon and melted upon impact. But while it's likely that the strange substance is just melted rock, scientists aren't 100% sure. 
This is because the pictures were captured under bad lighting conditions, and there were a bunch of other factors that badly impacted the quality of the images. So, the jury is still out on this one. There's a huge space cucumber floating through the galaxy, and no one really knows where it came from or why it's there. Okay, it's not exactly a cucumber. Or a pickle. It's more likely a super elongated rock. Scientists think it may be longer than half a mile, but only 540 feet wide. It's traveling so quickly that there's no way it's bound by our sun's gravity, meaning that the strange object was formed somewhere outside of our solar system. We don't even know how long it's been wandering through space. It's estimated that it entered our solar system during the Victorian era, but who knows where it had traveled before then. For years, we've been told there are eight planets in our solar system. Nine, if you count Pluto, which got kicked out of the club some years ago. But that might all be about to change. There may be an enormous secret world lurking in the midst of our system, which scientists are calling Planet Nine. This undiscovered planet could be way out past Neptune. There are seemingly unexplained clusters of orbits there, and this hidden ninth planet would explain this. The planet, if it exists, would be 10 times the size of Earth, take at least 10,000 years to orbit the Sun, and would sit over 200 times further out than our home planet. This is why it's been so tricky to identify, as it's almost impossible to take a picture of. In 2019, 30% of the area that the planet is likely to be in had been searched. It will take at least another two years to cover the remaining area. In the meantime, we'll be waiting on the edge of our seats. Mm, no. Strange radio waves are beaming down on Earth, and scientists are baffled. These fast radio bursts are sudden, unexplained, and last just milliseconds. We first picked up the weird signals in 2007, and scientists have been scratching their heads ever since. They appear to be coming from outside the Milky Way, millions of light years away. For us to pick them up from that far away, they must be emitting more energy in a fraction of a second than the Sun does in 80 years. Most of these signals only came once, which would have made identifying them much easier, until this all changed in 2017. In August, a signal was picked up that repeated 93 times, ruling out speculation that the signals were being caused by random one-off events. To this day, we still don't know what's causing the signals. Back in 2014, NASA captured a surprising picture of the sun that showed that it might like to play dress-up. A brilliant storm of magnetic fields caused the sun to look like a flaming jack-o'-lantern. Even weirder is that the image was captured on October 8th. It was possible because of something called active regions. These are basically areas of the sun that have greater levels of light and energy. This is what gives the flaming look in the images. The light forms two eyes, a nose, and a wide, jagged, smiling mouth. Fortunately, this look was just a coincidence, and there isn't a giant pumpkin-carving enthusiast lurking in the depths of space. Hey, I want to know, is this a trick or treat? Space fans spotted what appeared to look like a spoon on the surface of Mars. It was half covered in dust. They noticed it after images from a Mars rover had been released. As spooky as the suspicious silverware may sound, it was just a trick of the light. The spoon is just a regular old rock, albeit in a slightly odd shape. The play of shadows in the photo made the object look even more spoon-like. Maybe there's a dish nearby that the spoon ran away with. A cosmic eyeball floating somewhere among the stars is no regular-sized eye. It measures an incredible 660 miles across. One of Saturn's moons, Tethys, has become a bit of a celeb to space fans. The spherical moon sports a large crater that makes it look exactly like a giant interplanetary eyeball. There's even a set of peaks inside the crater that look like an iris. Saturn has a gang of 60 moons in total, and Tethys isn't the only one that looks like a random Earth object. Prometheus looks like a potato, Atlas resembles a pita bread freshly served from a Greek restaurant, and Mimas even looks like some villain spacecraft. And then there's this. There's a giant cat's eye right in the middle of space. Its official name is NGC 6543, but that's kind of long and boring, so most people call it the Cat's Eye Nebula. And it's actually one of the first nebulas to have ever been discovered. 
Like other nebulas, it was formed by a star that shed its outer layer of gas. The gas floated off and produced this amazing and intriguing structure. The star fires off this layer of gas every 1,500 years. Each time it does this, it creates a spectacular new dust shell. Hey, don't get me started on gas. When astronomers started a project that was organized to create a detailed 3D map of our galaxy, they didn't expect to find anything surprising. But that's exactly what happened. Earlier in that year, Harvard scientist Dr. Anna Bonaca noticed a weird disturbance in our galaxy's stellar streams. A stellar stream is a line of stars that are moving together through galaxies. The stellar stream we're talking about is called GD1, and it's stretched in an impressive line across our sky. This stream used to be a cohesive line stretched by the gravity of our galaxy. One day, Dr. Banaka noticed a gap in it, and this gap had a strange ragged edge. In fact, it looked like something terrifyingly huge recently plunged through the stellar stream. The sheer force of this object's gravity was so great that it managed to drag stars in its wake. The most shocking thing was that the telescopes simply failed to find the source of the damage. But then, what could this unseen bullet be? One theory suggests that the intruder is a stray star. But, according to Dr. Banaka, the hole is way bigger than any existing star. It'd have to be a million times more massive than our sun. Okay, so what if the hole in the Milky Way was torn by a supermassive black hole, like the one that dwells in the center of our galaxy? If these two black holes got too close, they wouldn't be able to escape each other's gravity. A collision might be inevitable. Then the stronger of the two holes would consume the weaker one, and one huge, super mighty black hole would appear. But people have yet to witness a collision of black holes. Plus, scientists can't predict the consequences of such a merge, even though they've simulated it on powerful computers. The only obvious fact is that it would produce incredible amounts of energy. Huge ripples would travel through the entire universe, bound to hit our planet eventually. Then again, two black holes in one galaxy might refuse to merge. Imagine this. A supermassive black hole, hundreds of millions of times the mass of the Sun, is spinning in the center of the Milky Way at a phenomenal speed. Another spinning black hole approaches ours. What do you think will happen? Right, one of the holes, most likely the intruder, will get kicked out and sent hurtling away like a frisbee flying through space. And who can guarantee that it wouldn't head toward the Earth? Luckily for us, there aren't any supermassive black holes in the vicinity, so this theory fails to explain the mysterious bullet hole phenomenon. Dr. Bonaka still doesn't rule out the possibility that the intruder is some kind of luminous, star-like object. After tearing a hole in the Milky Way, it could be hiding somewhere in the galaxy. But again, it seems highly unlikely because of the object's huge size. I mean, we're talking 30 to 65 light years across. In any case, it's hard to predict where it would have ended up if it were a luminous object. The intruder could have been moving at an incredibly high speed and wouldn't have to be very massive to tear a hole in the stellar stream. Or it could have been moving more slowly but be very heavy. But the astronomers don't know which option it was. That's why it's next to impossible to predict where it ended up. While we may think of ourselves as advanced after catching a glimpse of the eight planets of our solar system and their 200 moons, we really have little idea of what's out there. So much so that there's speculation that there might be one more planet in our solar system. Scientists call it Planet X or Planet 9. This undiscovered world could be hidden way out past Neptune. Asteroids and dwarf planets in this area have weirdly unexplained altered orbits, and Planet X may be the reason. Tales of this mysterious planet began over a hundred years ago with a man called Percival Lowell. Lowell had a great love of space. And aside from having an impressive mustache, he was also super rich. Ooh, that lucky guy. He used his riches to build an observatory in Arizona. He then dedicated it to study the odd motions of Uranus and Neptune. Their gravitational pulls are slower than those of all the other planets in our solar system. 
almost as if there is a giant hidden object pulling them off course. In 1906, Lowell theorized that there could be another planet out beyond Neptune. It probably caused those strange cosmic happenings. The man called this potential space body Planet X. In 1908, 